and you can't even drive? I can. Are you stupid, eh? Are you a stupid fool? Well, why can't you drive then? You can't even drive. A bit grey today, isn't it? I'm here, just about. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there's not the police coming to take me away. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm uh, so as you as you may be able to tell, I am still not feeling very well, and uh, this is the best my voice has sounded all day. But I've literally just had like you know gargling salt and things just to get to this point. So I'm going to basically we're going to set up this show here. And then I'm going to I'm going to duck out and leave it to the pros uh, to, to to discuss this. Um, just before we get going, um, you will have seen that I've uh, I just released the trailer for Women's Hour, which is getting a lot of uh, hype, a lot of attention, and um, so that's going to be going. Uh, that's before Cigar Stream tomorrow. Uh, in theory, Cigar Stream is going ahead, but uh, if I'm feeling like this, it might not be. Um, I'm still waiting AA for you to be picked up by the uh, National TV Awards for you know creating so many new shows in one year. You know you gotta you know move move aside line of duty. You know. I mean, what about what about what I've done for women? My diversity. Like, I have done they'll, more. They'll statues to you. I've done you more know. for women's voices, uh, so trans voices, exactly, gay voices. Uh, D is also unwell, by the way, which is another reason why we're not doing a uh, um, Warhol. But Warhol Part f Four has been moved to next week. Um, uh, anyway, what is it that inspired this stream, other than the fact that me and D are ill? And it was because uh, V, that uh, subversive Romanian, uh, has um, who who literally. I mean, I don't I don't have a go at V, old old buddy, uh, old buddy of ours. Um, but for someone who spends all his time posting like the most degenerate anime manga stuff I've ever seen, like on, on what basis does he post something like this? Is my question. It's like, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, the, the Japanese trap with big boobs is fine, but, uh, you know, modernist art from 1920 isn't, um, <laughs> But anyway, I saw this, um, and it immediately triggered me and Dee, and I think Alexander Adams independently, and Pharaoh independently, um, which is how wrong-headed this populist take, I guess, on what is trad art and what is quote-unquote modern art. Um, and I know in the chat, um, Dee was saying, like, why is it that to, to these people quote-unquote trad art is always kind of like this you know 19th century kind of quasi-realism um it's always that style isn't it um and this is something that uh alexander adams in his amazing talk at the event uh touched on mm. uh, you said about the importance for you know the uh our circles or the dissident right whatever you want to call it not to alienate potential allies through this frankly philistine view of art do you want to say a bit more about that before i uh, disappear uh yes well, firstly thank you very much for asking me on ai they said it would never happen it was like de niro and pacino on screen together we have a singularity of aas <laughs> so, yeah but then when it happened like it was heat that good i mean i, I remember <laughs> that being a massive like built up so massively and it's like oh they're in a coffee shop and they're just <laughs> looking at each other I mean, I will say, I, I like Heat for different reasons. She's got a great ass! Oh, there's my, there, there really is my oh, voice. God, sorry. I was going to say, did Mrs. AA find your browsing history? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Brazilian Brazilian posting. No, yeah. what, what, I, what I like about Heat is that uh, Pacino, his character is just insane in that film. Like, from the set, like, there's a... Do you remember at the start, he just grabs a television and throws out the window and is like, you're not ever, you know... Uh, anyway, we got off track. Um, yes, so they said it would never happen, but here he is. Um, I have been uh, glancing at your books uh, ever since uh, I picked them up at the event, and I've got quite a few questions, but I will have to be a stream for a different day. Why didn't you just uh, very quickly mention the, the overarching idea here? Why does this rankle so much, this 
kind of quick meme view that trad art was all like this before World War Two, and then now you know it's modern art like Rothko or whatever. Well, uh, first of all, it's a lot more complex than that. Uh, and I should put my cards on the table and say that I do like modern art, but I also do like traditional art. Uh, and I've written a lot on art history and so forth, going back to the Renaissance, going back to the ancient Greeks and the Romans and so forth. So uh, I'm perfectly open to liking and supporting traditional art, conventional art, realistic art, whatever you want to call it. But I don't see why that means I cannot appreciate modern art. So I think in that respect, I'm quite close to um, Mr. D's perspective. Uh, get well soon, Mr. D. Um, yeah. do, do, do you think that has anything, I mean, before I uh, go and die um, in a minute, uh, do you think that has anything to do with coming from a kind of art background, being educated in these things? And um, I mean, Pharaoh, do you do you have the same view or, or are, you, are you a bit closer to the to the V's of this world? Uh, I yeah, I, I think uh, my personal tastes are of what you call what, what these guys are trying to depict as traditional art. But I, I thought you made a really interesting point around um, traditional art is defined somehow as exclusively 19th century. You know, we never see any, you know, Byzantine icons being brought into these kind of memes or, you know, things that are, you know, relatively abstract still, you know. So it, it poses some really interesting questions, um, and and uh, you know, there's questions of the, pop, the the kind of populism versus elitism. There's questions are, as around, um, you know, what does it mean to be a traditional artist, and ca can we capture that again? And also some interesting stuff about authenticity, which again is a hot hot topic, as per your uh, excellent latest video. So well, I'm um, always the trend, even when I'm ill, I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> exactly um but just just very quickly on the point about education this is something that rankles uh with a lot of people uh alexander i mean correct me if i'm wrong you have a background in this you are um an educated and cultured man when it comes to the art world right yeah so i did um a degree in art history i'm also a practicing artist i've been a, an art critic for oh, 10 15 years um, so yes, I have been I have been schooled in the ways of modernism, but also schooled in the ways of traditional art as well. That was part of I did my degree at a time when you would actually cover um, the, the canon, as it were, uh, ancient art and so forth. So I'm I'm aware of all that work as well and the ideas and um, um, connoisseurship, which I think can also be applied to modern art as well. It's it's not quite as obvious. It's got some slightly different criteria, but uh, yeah, there's this. Uh, um, channel called uh, formalism which is basically where you're appreciating modern art but you're appreciating it not just for its ideas but just uh, but also for its um plastic qualities for its um uh you know its, its paint the material the colors the forms and so forth so yeah i mean i can already see uh you know there's always been a split on this topic and um some people in the chat saying well you know a great piece of art shouldn't require any education to understand. You know, this is just kind of emperor's new clothes, elitism, um, and so that's on one extreme. And then on the and you, you, you know you've got basically got the ideal of um, it's always the ideal of the transcendent beauty that, that speaks to an eternal truth on one side, and you don't need a PhD in art to understand it. Um, versus uh, almost the opposite extreme of this argument, which is the one that D often espouses, often with some anger, that um, basically it's not for everybody, and uh, why should it be? Um, you know, some art is elitist by its very nature. Screw well, the trucks. <laughs> yeah, well, I, well, I would say both both positions have some truth because you don't need education to respond strongly to an abstract painting. Uh, you can be, you know, you can be absorbed by it. You can um, be excited by the colours, by the experience of viewing it, by the way it alters as you view it, because uh, pictures do alter over time, just um, from a perceptual level. Uh, and also, then you'd also got this point of view that, well, you can, you can't become an, an a full appreciator of something until you have a lot of experience in it. So you don't, you don't know anything about wine until you've tasted, you know five dozen six dozen wines and you can start to differentiate between the types and you gain your you build your knowledge through experience not just through education not just through sort of um being told what is good 
but you actually come to form your own opinions through having both expertise and also experience. And, and just coming in on this point, I think I think this is really interesting because, again, I think, I think the way you've set up this uh, dichotomy, the uh, elitism versus populism in, in, um knowledge versus lack of knowledge um, isn't, again, strictly traditional. And again, this is why I think all of this does sort of tie back to some of the some of the stuff you were mentioning in your video. AA. I've got to say that I am I have I have drafted a response video that will be released today bringing up some of these points and i don't want to spoil too oh, much from it very interesting there's been two so far there's been mark and morgoth yeah, you're in, yeah some both very good. You're, you're in some you know talk about the trucks and the elites no, <laughs> <laughs> so um but, uh yes yeah. oh, sorry, sorry just to go yeah. back to this this point in a oh. second sorry yeah. and, and and that is that um there is an intellectual understanding about a painting. So say, for example, if you looked at a classical work or a neoclassical work, you need to have knowledge to understand what's going on. Um, so for example, if you saw like a, a Greek vase with, um, you know, a guy with some feathers on, a, on his feet, uh, you, um, uh, an ignorant person would be like, w why is he doing that? Who is he? But to uh, someone in the know, that would be instantly recognized as a heroic figure probably Perseus. And and so there's a whole load of um, kind of additional thoughts and references you're pulling in through that knowledge. So knowledge allows you to kind of connect the dots, uh, bring in other artists into your understanding. But at the same time, there's something else. Um, what, um, again, what the medievals called um, the passions or being able to kind of connect with the work at a more kind of guttural or vin uh, vis visceral um, level, which isn't an intellectual. So again, um, when Plato's d describing um, his um, theory of the soul, there's kind of three different parts to it. The kind of um, the intellect part, there is the um, the kind of guttural, pa the, the, the kind of source of the passions, and um, uh, and the chest, which kind of conducts uh, both of those two moments. And, and what you get through experience is yes, you get some this kind of intellect side, but also you also kind of work on um, your, your passions as as well. So I, I think it's not. I think someone like a PhD in uh, in art, maybe they've got a lot of intellect, but maybe they don't have those kind of um, deeper levels of connection. You know, we, we call it um, empathy today. We think of it in a very scientific way about an emotional connection with a, with a work of art. But uh, an ancient view on it would have said that you have something like um, sensibility, the ability to react to art. I don't know if you ever follow, um, um, you know, Saffron on Twitter. She mentioned she was kind of looking at a piece of art and was just like physically overwhelmed by the power of it. That is that kind of the, the passions that, that the medievals would describe, that kind of um, um, complete overwhelming um, nature. And that is something that is built up through experience. So, so again, it's not just about um, look, uh, knowledge and understanding what's on the painting. It's about being able to be a person that can kind of connect with art as well. Oh, well, I mean, before I leave, I can say I've been to many galleries around the world, old art, new art. I have never been overwhelmed by anything. <laughs> but, you know, I am literally, you know, a, a literature PhD who hates literature, so there we go. Um, well, uh, I, 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 I just, honestly, in, in my response video, I do call you uh, a defective human in the in, in the best way possible. No, I, will, no. I will be bullying you quite hard just to warn be, you. So. Be, before we before I uh, duck out of here, I will say that Benjamin Rood has been saying that um, you guys and, and Alexander Adams in particular and me should be wary of straw manning. Um, that is, D's meme here is not the strongest position. He's like, well, why can't you get Jonathan uh, P. Gow on here, you know, or like respond to Scruton, you know, respond to Scruton, don't respond to V, you know. Um, do you think there's any merit to that kind of line of argument where it's like, well, you're being unfair, you're presenting like the weakest, the weakest version of this argument by using the meme uh, from V rather than you know, something by Brian Seward or something, you know? Mm, I think well, yes and no. I mean, obviously, 
I mean, it's easy to sort of point point and laugh at something that's put in such a sim simple way, but I do understand the traditionalist arguments, and I have read Scruton, and I, I have a lot of sort of colleagues who are very strong on tradition, uh, and I have heard their arguments, and they do have some valid criticisms of modern art and contemporary art. Uh, also, we should note that there's a division between the modernists and the postmodernists. The, the postmodernists really loathe both the modernists and the traditionals. The postmodernists absolutely hate material things. They hate beauty. They hate people responding honestly to work. They hate formalism because it includes um, some degree of standards, some degree of objectivity. So um, the postmodernists are really the, the people we should be most antipathetical towards. I think there is a natural alliance between people like me who are uh, fans of modernism, but also like traditional art, and also the traditionalists. And our enemies are the postmodernists and the progressives. Just going back to, you, to this point around, we should we should get the best target possible. The, the, the thing is that 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 um, Scruton's not being the one that's being passed around. Scruton's not the one that gets millions of views by people. It, it's literally these low tier memes that, that get passed around. So I don't know why we shouldn't we should like somehow uh, you know decide that then they're, they're not um, dangerous because in my my mind these are this is a dangerous idea that needs to be challenged uh, and and confronted. Um, but like, uh, yeah, but by all means get, um, get someone who can represent Scruton well, but, um, uh, all right. So what I'm going to do now, chaps, I'm going to, I am listening, but I'm, I'm going to duck out of here. Um, so, I, so as to not just be like coughing all the way through this. So, uh, but I, I'm, uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to, to seeing, uh, what Alexander has prepared for us here. Uh, cause I, this is an important topic. All right. See you later. Thank you very much. Right, so I think we've got um, sort of uh, two topics here. Uh, so one is sort of what's the reaction to realism and modernism by the traditionalists or the right, um, um, and also what would you what would we call um, the a proper approach to the art of the ideal state if we were to remake the state? Because I think those two areas are over overlapping. What do you think, Farah? I think that sounds good. Before we start, c could I just ask for some definitions? Because again, I, I, I was thinking about this, like, do, does everyone even know what we're talking about here from a basic level? When you talk about a traditional artist, a modern artist, and a postmodern artist, what do you think um, defines that kind of artist? Um, and um, yeah, what are the kind of ideologies behind it? Okay, well, I would say that the, let's say the traditional artist is someone who's working, uh, let's say until about sort of um, until the beginning of modernism. So let's say, um, so let's say, I don't know, maybe 1870. So the Impressionists are maybe the first modern artists. So before then, you had sort of academic art, you had um, romantic art, neoclassical, Renaissance artists, the art of the, uh, the ancient Greeks and so forth. And that's, that's a huge span. And there's many, many differences within it, but you could broadly say that these are either traditional or developed from tradition. And they're very closely tied to tradition, to the canon, to particular skills, to particular ways of thinking about the function of art. Um, does that feel, seem a fair definition? Yes, so, so m maybe I would even um, step back and say, uh, a traditional artist is someone that, um, just paints from tradition. That is that um, they rely on yeah the, the, the canon or past pe periods of work for the work of the future. Just like a, a tree growing growing organically, like a leaf springs out of a branch. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. Now, how, how would you do the same for, for modernism? What would you like? What 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 do you think makes the impressionists so different to traditional artists? Okay, so the modernists, I would say that they start, they start talking in different terms. They start thinking of terms not uh, being purely pictorial or being symbolic. They start to move on to optical. So they start saying, we're really interested not in uh, painting a, a great general or a biblical scene. We're interested in capturing light. So we're interested in optical effects. We're we're interested in um, broken brushwork. We're interested in 
uh, highlights uh, in uh, in making uh, the brushwork very visible and so forth, playing with optical effects. So these are something, these are sort of extra, extra, extra symbolic, that they're not, they're outside the idea of a narrative or outside of symbolism. Um, and so you have this sort of uh, line of uh, optical painting, which becomes dominant, I think, um, yeah, so I think we can actually look at it. Uh, so you, can you see this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this, is, so this is um, Alfred Barr's um, diagram of art. It's actually just a diagram of modern art, because you'll see that there's nowhere on this that mentions traditional art, um, mm. salon painting, and so forth, a realistic art. So you have um, different strands. You know, so he wrote this up in 1937. He was involved in the foundation of the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. So this was when people started to say, okay, modernism has certain roots and they are different from traditional art. So traditional art would be something like um, the salon paintings, the academic painters, pre-Raphaelite painters, the arts and crafts movements, uh, also symbolism. Uh, symbolism is, we did some streams on this, so if anyone's interested, they can find these streams on your channel. Um, and they're not included in this list. So this is like a sort of a diagram of how modernism developed. Um, so this uh, this covers um, the optical strand as opposed to the sort of the narrative strand. The narrative is academic and salon painting. The modernist strand is the optical strand. So you've got Van Gogh and Neo-Impressionists and the Fauves, which is Matisse and then so forth and so forth. Can we just go back to this idea of what is the, the modernist a second? Because I, I think it's it's really interesting in, in, in my mind, because firstly, uh, like you said, it's about um, subject. It's about redefining like what is art as well. So again, that kind of yeah. the, the, fo the focus on, um, again, the traditional view of art is that it is, uh, you know, again, for, okay, if I, I'm using something like Ruskin's three uses of art, it would be, uh, a moral function, it would be a utilitarian, um, and it would be a religious function. Most mm. of it's focused on like, um, you are receiving transcendent truths from the art. So it's not necessarily about the physicality of it, it's about uh, how the art moves you. The modernist viewpoint is, uh, it, it is about the physicality of the art. And, and again, um, that move away from those kind of transcendent ideals to, um, there is value in um, a technique itself, if that makes sense. And, and that's where a lot of that, that, like, say, for example, the optical effects stuff, uh, or like Surratt, who is creating, um, you know, beautiful paintings using like lots of dots. Mm -hmm. He is, he's almost like a, a scientist experimenting um, with technique to create something new. And, and again, I think when defining uh, modernism, novelty is, is the watchword. It's about, um, cr creating something that no one else has done done before. That that's the fundamentals of it. I think. Secondly, it's about a non uh, canonical um, viewpoint. So again, none of this stuff is drawing from a previous tradition. So, for example, um, the French nineteenth century neoclass uh, neoclassical painters like David, for example, he's drawing on uh, you know classical sources, but also um, yeah, like um, realism and romanticism, et cetera. So, so they're sort of plumbed into this this canon. But what I think is interesting about modernism is that they, they end up with a canon of their own. You know, what is this mm. diagram, if not a form of traditionalism? But it's kind of been decoupled. Again, going back to my tree analogy, it's, it's almost like an acorn has plopped off a tree and has, <laughs> has started to grow in its, in its, in its own regard. But, mm. you know, modernism is, um, is connected just to um, other forms of modernism. Yeah, and what, what you don't see here is, of course, is how modernism developed. So this is uh, early modernism, sort of high modernism. Late modernism comes after 1945, and that's uh, characterized by abstract expressionism, the New York school, so that's Jackson Pollock and um, da, 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 Mark Rothko and so forth. Then you have post, um, sort of post painterly abstraction and minimalism. And that's in the 1960s. Then there's a break. And I think the beginning of postmodernism is 1967 or 1969, according to different authorities. And that's basically when art becomes dematerialized. People are become big fans of conceptual art, 
well, this is the birth of conceptual art, of happenings, of events. Uh, people start um, rediscovering the work of Duchamp. Uh, so you get conceptual art, you get land art. So people sculpting, you know, uh, you know, doing some ar architectural work in the landscape and so forth. That's land art. Um, you got performance art and so forth, and that's postmodernism. So I would say that this this is the core of modernism that you can see on the screen, and then postmodernism comes in 1967, and 19, um, and then you get this idea, you get this concept that art becomes an idea, uh, and it's completely dematerialized, and it's um, just in, an expression of an idea through a prompt the you know that you know when damien hurst's shark a prime example of postmodernism um when the shark disintegrates and rots away it will just simply be replaced by a different shark and the, the work of art continues the same the concept will be the same the impact will be the same the meaning will be the same um even though the work of art has actually physically changed mm. just just Rolling back a second to something you mentioned around mediums, because I think that's something, again, people can often recognize, is that um, one of the aspects of modern art, probably due to the, no uh, the importance of novelty, is the need to um, work in as many new uh, mediums as possible. And, and so, again, if, if you think about the traditional canon, um, you know, there are, I don't know, 12 mediums for fine art that have been used in 2000 years from from this modernist period. Like you said, there's conceptual art, there's video art, there, mm -hmm. there's all, all new. There's, there is more kind of new mediums created in the modernist period than had actually been in the whole of tradition beforehand. But so so again, one criticism could be um, it's not art because it's it's a, on a non-traditional medium but here's a question for you um none not all of the mediums that we accept as traditional um originated at like the beginning of time or from the ancients just one a one brilliant example of that is oil painting so for example um you know oil painting was it's a, it's a scientific revolution that happened uh, during the Re renaissance it came out of uh Amst um uh the is it, uh would it be flemish um, yeah, Fle Flemish painter. Well, yes, the uh, the, uh, the early Netherlandish painters. So yeah, Van, yeah. Jan van Eyck and um, his brother Hubert uh, are credited as being the perfectors of um, oil painting in the early fifteenth century. Yeah. So, so when when someone comes to you and says, "Okay, well, actually, you know, just doing some performance art, that's not a a, a traditional um, form of art." You have to ask the question is like well, what like why is it not valid because if the traditional canon is allowed to add in new forms from their perspective why shouldn't you add in additional ones on top and i, th I think that's a that's a, a real um um ch challenging point to to that thought so um yeah sorry please yeah please well uh, well I, I would also say you know we, when we talk about paris um if you go to my blog which is linked in the show notes you'll find a review there of um, Baron Haussmann's uh, redevelopment of Paris. So when you say, when you talk about Paris and people say, oh, Paris is a beautiful city, you know, there's all these wonderful buildings and you've got this such, so you've got a, a degree of sort of unity and, um, you know, care, careful blend, is careful uh, synthesis of different styles. And you've got the sort of new, new sort of uh, neoclassical Haussmann style um, terraces that you find so typical of, of um, Paris. Well, those were actually, a new invention. They were invented, what, in the 1860s, 1870s? Mm. And they were actually, and you actually bought them off, off plan. There was actually a, a set a set number of designs that you could have, and this was an all industrialized. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the components were pre-manufactured to speed up um, building. So people who say, oh, I'm a traditionalist, I really love Hausmann. Well, Hausmann is the, the, the prototype of the modernist architect working off plan. So, it, it depends traditionalists and conservatives it's like well where are you drawing your line because you know uh, ultimately what you're calling traditional is something that was innovatory and new and technologically advanced at some part in the past and you just happen to have decided that that's your cutoff period mm. D just in terms of uh, like more of these um, myths about what traditional art is um, i think we should talk about um, abstraction and perspective 
because again, um, the, there is the kind of classic line, uh, you know, modernist art is art painted by by children, and I, I guess the reason why um, it often it looks like that for for a you know a, a large amount is the abandonment of perspective, the abandonment of um, uh, like an attempt to depict things uh, really. But when you look at the traditional canon, specifically around um, Byzantine works, specifically around uh, like early fresco works, that there there is an abandonment of well, they, they don't even have perspective at that point, and there's an abandonment of um, realism. There's an intentional push towards um, not depicting reality, but, but depicting uh, ideas of kind of spiritual perfection through through the icon, um, and and so. Um, the problem I keep having in my head is that it's really hard to differentiate between the so-called traditional and the modernist schools. You know, like I said, it's not the medium. Um, it's not the, um, it's not a specific t technique, but, but there is still, um, there is a definite um, change. And I think it is around those kind of, um, bigger ide ideologies as to what was like the point of art where i think there is a bigger cutoff point is that kind of postmodernist moment um do you want to just talk through like how how did that happen um yeah well yeah i mean first i want to say something about the canon okay, because yeah I, I think what you're getting to at the heart of this is um Basically, the canon, which is uh, basically the, a set of uh, the best works in a particular genre. So this might be literature, this might be sculpture, might be painting, might be art in general, might be uh, poetry or drama or whatever. So the canon is a set, well, it's not, it's a, it's a collection of the most important and most significant works that you need to understand in order to understand the way that an art form is and to understand the key points of influence that have determined the way art has developed over a particular period. So the canon is a is kind of a is kind of a problem because the canon is used for determining the greatest points of aesthetic achievement, but there's not an aesthetic criterion for the canon. As you've said, if you try to look at if you try to look for realism, the stuff that isn't realistic in the canon. You try to look for something that has perspective. Well, not everything in the canon has perspective. Uh, uh, so um, bright colors. Well, there's some stuff in there that's um, grisé, which has got no kind of color at all. Uh, you've got all sorts of things that are in the canon, which are serious works of art, which are great works of art, but they, they don't have a standard aesthetic way of um, being measured. So this, is a, so this is something quite confusing. When you look at the canon, you'll find all sorts of stuff in there that um, you can't judge on an aesthetic basis, but overall it provides a guide to the high points of aesthetic creation. So you're, you're right, it's, it's quite paradoxical. Uh, I, I cannot help but observe the chat. And, and there's another interesting, interesting point. Um, this is from Jacob. Byzantine works don't have perspective, but they're still high effort. Uh, Jackson Pollock is yeah. not. So, could a definition for traditional versus modern be um, about, about the amount of time it takes to create a painting? And I, I guess, my, again, um, my challenge to that point would be that, um, again, it just depends on the, the technique, M maybe for uh, some supremacist art, for some vorticist art, or whatever, it, it would be su substantially faster than um, a realist painting. But there's plenty of uh, modernist work um, that took um, a large amount of time. That um, especially, uh, I think of the um, Novecento work of the Italians, which are um, an attempt to play with um, things like perspective and uh, and reality itself. That still um, requires a large technical effort in terms of time taken and skill level. Yeah, and also you've got uh, Mark Rothko. Mark Rothko's paintings—they look, you know, they're they're pretty. They look pretty simple. They're you know, like it's one or two shapes. It's like a rectangular shape floating on another color, and you think, oh, you know, that's an afternoon's work, isn't it? Well, no, he spent 
days and days. He spent, spent weeks putting on, you know, they've recorded like sort of 10, 20 different coats and he spent lots of time mixing the colors and adding different components to the paint. So he spent a lot of time. So it's it's really not as, it's not as cut and dried as saying, oh, low, low effort or high effort or, you know, that that, that isn't a good judgment. No. Also, there's there's a there's something interesting here where a good artist ironically needs less time than a bad artist. And I don't know if you've ever, ever heard of the story where uh, I, I think it's like a Chinese fable where um, the king asks the court artist to um, do some cal calligraphy for him. And um, the artist says, OK, give me give me six months. Or no, give me six years and I'll be able to uh, get that for you. Um, and he goes away to some kind of forest somewhere. And then the king's man uh, comes back six years later and knocks on this guy's door and then says, can I have this uh, bit of calligraphy, please? And the artist rolls out his um, scroll and then just does it on the spot in about five, five seconds. Then the king's man was like, why, why did it take six years for you to do something that took 10 seconds? And then he opened up the next room to show uh, hundreds and thousands of other pieces of work um, that, that weren't perfect. And, and so I, I think one problem I have with saying uh, it take like time equals quality, that's not necessarily true because a great artist is faster by default. Um, so I, again, I, I think any kind of definition of uh, traditional versus modern on um, like effort uh, or certainly time taken alone is always going to fail. Yeah. Yeah. So I think maybe um, when we talk about the art of the uh, an ideal art, I think maybe this um, this David um, sculpture, well, the the Michelangelo sculpture of David, um, fifteen oh one to fifteen oh four. This was this was originally due to be part of um, the cathedral in Florence, but it was actually set up in the town square because it was sent because it was. Ex um, seen to symbolize the the strength of the Florentine Republic uh, as a sort of as a youthful um, vigorous defeater of Goliath um, so that this was when they were fighting Milan I think at the time and so this is so this embodies the idea of the the great civic work of art that you might you might want for a, a reconstructed ideal society um, because it combines the divine uh, the classical and the civic. Uh, what do you think about this? Uh, I, I mean, obviously, it's a you know a, a beautiful bit of sculpture, but again, I think it poses some really interesting questions as around this idea of um, traditionalism and, and realism. So, if if you note the proportions of um, the figure, his head is much much larger uh, than his feet. Um, but the reason Michelangelo uh, did that was because obviously he recognised that people. Um, would be looking at it from below. And again, because of perspective, by slightly inflating the head, um, it's going to look... And also the hands as well. The yeah. hands as well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it, it, uh, it looks better. So in a weird way, he's distorted reality, he's twisted reality to make it more beautiful. A again, there's the classic thing around... Um, <laughs> sorry to be so crass, but penis size and um, and sculpture. And again, the Athenians were well known for shrinking the size of their um, of their models. And the reason behind was it behind it was um, that uh, what well, I've always this is what I've always heard, and I don't know if this is true that it was it was a sign of higher intellect or something like that. But again, it's it's interesting how um, reality has been perverted for an attempt uh, at beauty. So again, is tradition is a true traditional art about 100% depiction of, of reality? Classicism itself is, re is really interesting in my mind because it's all about uh, depicting uh, um, like ideal, almost platonic, you know, the pl uh, platonic pure, pure forms. Like people don't, in like this is not reality for most of the people in Florence during <laughs> during the renaissance <laughs> you know they're going to be shorter they're going to be un unfit they're malnourished or f like either too thin or too too fat and um so so it, it's not about reality it's about trying to understand what beauty is and uh, to define it
Yeah, absolutely, and it, it's got it's got a transcendental quality um, because it's supposed to be sort of you know um, da David chosen chosen by God to defeat Goliath. Yes, um, and in the same way that the uh, the Florentines thought of themselves as selected by God to you know build build the city of God on earth, as it were. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you're, you're quite you're quite right. Even uh, even classical art that you that you Renaissance art that you think of, we get we get something of a distorted picture because we look through these books of Renaissance paintings and we see all these sort of Venuses and so forth, and we think, oh, how wonderful it would have been to live back in those times to be surrounded by such great art. Well, you're only seeing the very best art, and this art was commissioned by princes and dukes and kings, and it was kept in their rooms. And it was kept, you know, and Venuses were not for public consumption. They were put in the bedrooms and they were not they were not shown to the plebs. So although you have this business of the Renaissance creating great art for public consumption, you also have the elite. And so here we have like a division between the elite and the population. So the elite was producing or commissioning art for its own consumption, which was not for the population, and indeed would have been considered somewhat sinful and scurrilous had it been exposed to the population. So, uh, so there was a question of double standards right from the very beginning. Um, so the idea that you know, but that um, traditional art and that Renaissance art was for the people was not strictly speaking true, because the average person in fifteen hundred would see they'd see some public sculpture they'd see stained glass windows which you've covered very well in your your uh, art of revelations and so forth um and they would have um prints in their bible um and that would be pretty much it they would not have access to many oil paintings except maybe if they were in a church i i think this po this point around uh elitism versus populism is interesting because in uh i'm i don't necessarily agree purely with um with d this idea that art is um by its nature uh elite i'm i'm almost of the you know the bell curve meme where um it's something that that a simple man can recognize and say that's beautiful and a great man can understand that's beautiful, but he will achieve it. He will understand it at, at an even higher level than just that that um, that that facile reading. But again, I guess there's sort of two elements to this populist elitism uh, axis, where it's like, um, should art be uh, accessible by default, and actually was it? And and to, I guess to your point, uh, Alexander most art wasn't accessible to most people um, for a large proportion of traditional uh, traditional period. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, let's have a look. Um, huh, okay. Right. So here we are. Yeah. So <laughs> this is, this is what you have. This is what happens when you get um, uh, perhaps a little bit too critical of modernist art. So this is um, the uh, art from the Degenerate Art Show in Berlin. Oh, well, this is, I think they've got this wrong. Um, the, the show was actually in Munich, unless it traveled maybe. So anyway, we've got two people here from the uh, mid-century Germans having a look at a painting by um, Gross, I think it is, of uh, war veterans. Mm -hmm. And they saw this as both, they saw this as, um, you know, Bolshevik nonsense, cultural Bolshevism, as they said. Remember that uh, cultural Marxism, which made, made famous by Jordan Peterson, is not the same as cultural Bolshevism, whatever um, uh, Vox tells you. It's something slightly different. So cultural Bolshevism is a deliberate attempt to subvert the standards of um, uh, Western Christian society through the promotion of um, Marxism, um, as, as, as you know, sort of uh, circulated by the Soviets, as it were. Uh, I, I think, interestingly for me, um, some of the strongest arguments against modern art are actually for a, <laughs> a similar reason to why these galleries are set up. And, and again, I think um, the, the traditional perspective is always that art uh, moves people. That's the, that's the kind of purpose of, purpose of it. Again, if you want to think of it in a more a facile way, um, 
it's a kind of propaganda. You know, what's the difference between a propaganda poster and a, and a painting? Uh, well, they they both have um, a message behind them, and their aim is to to move people in a certain direction. Now, a propaganda poster is uh, is pretty obvious what the what that message is, and they're quite explicit about what you want to do off the back of it. Mm. Uh, uh, and it's t typically something physical. Well, again, in traditional art, the, it's trying to move people to, uh, again, these trans transcendental ideas of beauty, goodness, and truth. Now, what, what, what the modernists do is to subvert the subject quite often. And again, looking, thinking about um, someone like Picasso, uh, or in fact, if we go back to the, the classic, um, uh, what's the, is it Olympia? Um, no. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yeah, uh, Manet's Olympia. Yeah, man is Olympia, where again, if, if you look at it, it's a very beautiful realist painting, but the subject is of a prostitute. And again, that, that, was, that was the thing that sh basically the, the, the salon that that was displayed at almost got burnt down because people were so up in arms. Because even though uh, a facile reading of it, you could have said, oh, it's a Venus. You know, it looks like a Titian's Venus or something like that. It's, it's a woman laid out on a bed. The point was that woman was, uh, because of some of the kind of, things around her was definitely um, a prostitute. And, uh, and from my perspective, um, this art is, you know, I think, I think art and culture is powerful and it moves people. Uh, and, and so I think one of the best ways you can, if you are a, uh, if you wanted to attack modernist art is to say like, what's the subject and what's the pur pur purpose to, of the art? Now, here's a question for you. Was this art actually Bolshevik propaganda? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting for me because, again, it's depicting um, veterans in a disabled uh, disabled form. And it's kind of, um, there is a reading of it where you could say, actually, this is about showing that the weakness of Germany at this point is it's a piece of art showing the folly of uh, the folly of war, which uh, as a subject, you can imagine, you can see why the uh, mid-century Germans were, were, were not were not a fan of it. So. Um, that that's a big question around um, subject and its subversive powers. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're quite right. You can have um, perfectly realistic art, which might be considered immoral, and you might have non-representational art, where you might have sort of, sort of more modernist work that you might consider moral. So this, you might interpret as uh, a modernist work, which is not realistic, but which has a moral meaning. It is saying, behold, witness what... Uh, war has done to our veterans. This is how ugly and crippled and ridiculous war has made them. And that this might be seen as a moral thing. So this might even be seen as a slightly patriotic. Although, I mean, actually, the, the, the German, the mid-century Germans considered any for, any form of pa of pacifism to be anti-patriotic. So, yeah, yeah just, just from AA and chat, the cheek of mocking World War II to that generation, though. And, and again, I think that's that's a really interesting point. Well, again, you, you, you do not get that kind of uh, attack. Um, it's almost an attack of the self. Can you think of any traditional art? Um, I, I guess maybe you could say something like punch or satirical art, but nothing as um, vicious um, from an ideological standpoint as modernist attack on on the self you well, you you could well you could say hogarth but then hogarth is pointing out follies he's pointing out weaknesses he's pointing out sins you know yeah. it, well, of, it's, of it's, drunkenness it's, of, of gambling and so forth so he's, he's critical of people becoming weak and not standing are not upholding general values so, but you're yeah. you're right they're not criticizing general values so sorry guys i i couldn't resist jumping in here um because of uh, this particular piece I, I think one of the problems here, I mean, the Hogarth comparison is interesting. But when I look at a Hogarth, I think there's a man who actually cares about his society, right? And who, yes, just you're looking at horrific scenes, but uh, behind it is a, is a kind of a deep concern about what's happening. It's almost like you could imagine, I don't know, somebody like Peter Hitchens or someone like that having mm, the same... Mm sort of um it comes from the same moral impetus the, the trouble with this piece here that we're looking at is that how can i put it um the germans at this moment in history ha uh, lots of the young men had been to war and they'd lost um there was a whether it's true or not 
a lot of people believed that the that the elite had backstabbed that had back that the german higher ups had backstabbed them and they could have won the war um now you could say well that's a cope that's not true but the fact is a lot of people believe this in, in germany mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. on top of that as we covered in the weimar stream um about a third of germans had lost their land because of uh, because of inflation and because of economic woes and that land had been bought up by let's just say outside interests um and um on top of that you had this moment you had this uh weimar elite a liberal elite um mm. made up of people who hadn't been to the war uh n not all of them obviously the conservative side uh you know had war veterans and so on but a lot of the people who ended up in the in charge of the cultural institutions and the arts establishment and the newspapers and so on were not uh let's let's just say they weren't patriotic germans um and i think at, at a moment like this where the country's down their pride is hurt something like this wouldn't have been interpreted like a hogarth it would have been interpreted mm. as like a kick in the nuts while you're already down mm. and and so you can you can kind of understand where they would have been like furious and wanted to you know not like wanted to kind of lock this away in the in the way that they did because mm. it's uh it's just offensive mm. a little bit like i mean i'm trying to think of an example the george floyd statue you know they, i mean many of us today take those memorials to george floyd as as being a humiliation ritual, right? Mm. And I, I, I think these mid-century Germans would have taken art like this as a, as a kind of humiliation ritual rather than anything that's, you know, anything that has any kind of noble artistic intention. So I just thought I'd mention that. Mm. Uh, what, what do it's you reckon, Alexander? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, you, if you were of a traditional mindset and you saw this painting, you would see this as mocking veterans. I think, uh, you, I mean, like if you were if you were anti-war, you would see this as saying, "Oh, look, look at the state our our, vet, our veterans have been reduced to." But if you're a traditionalist, you're saying, "Look, this is making a joke out of these men who have served bravely and who have given virtually everything that they have." So, yeah, I mean, I could see I could see why people would be very upset by this painting. Yeah. Yeah, just going back to Hogarth a second, I always think back to uh, Jonathan Swift's um definition of of satire which is um to, to mock someone with the hope of reforming them uh while sarcasm is just you know taking them down a peg and, and i think when you think about hogarth's work uh, like aa said it's always about uh, rehabilitation of the people it's about holding up a mirror to, to those people and, and, I, and i do th again it's, i'm eternally plagued by this the question about you know uh, the definition of of modernism maybe i think we've stumbled onto something here where again the modernist um it is an artist that has no um barriers to subject or something something like that mm. they're not afraid of um attacking their own people or their own um their own nation at the same time although they don't necessarily have to do that by default not all modernist art is subversive i would say and again if think about the like i think we need to spend some time on this the the, uh, the italian uh, the italian fascist art because it was modernist it was uh, challenging it was anti-traditional um but it was fundamentally nationalistic and um um in support uh, support of the the country at the same time uh yes yeah, so let's get to Oh, go away, you stupid. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, you're, you're right. So we, um, yeah. oh, but before we get to that, I should mention that there is, there's obviously naturalistic art, which is quite subversive. So, for example, there is a painter called Baltus um, who painted, who was a very knowledgeable about classical art, painted realistic pictures, depicting pubescent girls in sexually suggestive situations. So that would be an example of a realist art that I, I think a lot of populists would be quite unhappy about. 
So, you know, I mean, you're, you're right. It's, it's not just a question of style. It's also a question of intent and a question of subject. Um, so, yeah, so here we have um, some of the, so this is uh, Italian fascist art. So when I gave my talk, um, by the way, I would recommend anyone who hasn't and who's interested in this kind of subject to consider buying the book from the event, uh, which has all the talks in it, uh, including mine. Um, I, I gave it. I gave um, fascist Italy as an example of a, a traditionalist society, uh, relatively uh, well, strongly conserv well, strongly patriotic, relatively conservative, which combine which was not restrictive in terms of styles. It was not prescriptive. So you had a mixture. So you had modernism, you had traditionalism, and you had a fusion. And the fusion is most often found in these um, in these buildings. Uh, yeah, and, and like I think it's I, I think the buildings are pretty classical. And again, I saw um, was it Clossington and Chat mentioning how you know that the, the, the statues were very, very neoclassical and masculine. I mean, I mean, but you, they they are non traditional at the same time. If you look at the poses, if you look at what they're holding, how they're depicted. It, it hasn't really come out of that school. So again, uh, like you, you got to think that traditional art would be, for example, um, the Greek into the Roman sculpture, right? So at the beginning of uh, Roman sculpture, they copied all of the Greek statues uh, verbatim, although uh, like less well. But then the um, the kind of artists that hung around in Rome then uh, sort of grew beyond what the Greeks had done. Um, off the back of that work, but by you know taking and learning from that. If you look at the kind of sculptural work around um, the like EUR, for example, th there you go. You so can see it across, yeah. There you go. Like um, that's a, it, may, it may again to a facile reader, it may look like a, it's a classical sculpture because he's naked uh, and it's next to a horse. But again, like the pose is unique. Um, the way that, that the actual person is. Um, Kind of de depicted is not that realistic when you close uh, cl close up on them. So so again, it, it is still breaking with tradition. I think in a, in a significant way. I mean, when you go to some of the um, the paintings of the futurists, for example, that's uh, the, the kind of leap, the break with tradition is even higher in that area. Um, where again, like I said, pr perspective is abandoned. Um, any attempts at realism is abandoned. Um, so, so again, it, it is a significant move, in my opinion. Yeah. So the, the yeah, so so this is what so this is what you're seeing. You're seeing a fusion of modernism and classical is classical art. You're seeing classical mo uh, elements used in a non-traditional way. You're using uh, the the scale is of course much grander than uh, most classical buildings are. Um, yeah. So so this is. So this is what you might see as if you want a strong state, if you want it to be drawing on tradition, I think that Italy looks a much, a, a most healthy fusion um, compared to the other um, political, um, the other, the other uh, absolutist political regimes. So for example, I mean, we, we did, uh, series of three i think it was three streams on your channel about the art of fascism yep i think or and 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 including uh national social um including um Authorita yeah, so authoritarian art really i guess authoritarian art yeah yeah so yes yeah, so we had we had the we had the soviets in there as well uh and i think out of them i think we kind of decided that the uh the italians were slightly the the most the most broad and the most generous and the least uh the least propagandistic i mean outside of of course um the the statues for the olympics and the posters they were the least um um heavy-handed mm. yeah, yeah ex exactly and i think it's that all that entire school is basically totally forgotten um mm by uh, crit critics of um, of modernism yeah so so yeah so the, here we have is uh, so this is an example of the class of, of slightly more classically inflected modernist painting made by 
uh, Italians under in the fascist period. Uh, so we got Carlo Cara and uh, Giorgio de Carico there. Yeah. So, so with like um, the Cara stuff, it's it's obvious that there has been abstraction here. Like, look at the uh, look at the floor, look at the sky. Doesn't look like that. Doesn't this is a non-real painting? I mean, the, they've kept um, perspective on, um, on on that painting, but even the walls themselves are kind of molding and melting together. The shadows are sort of becoming um, uh, hedges at the same time. So again, it's I think I think it's just really hard to find that line in the sand and say number one that this is a modernist piece of art i mean i i think obviously it is but at the same time to say this is modernist and because it's modernist it's inherently bad yeah and also i would say when people say to you fascist art this is not what you think of you're, you're thinking of like uh, heroic muscular figures and um and well some other stuff that we'll probably see in a minute but you're not thinking of this and i would say that this is a more um, this is a this is something that harks back to tradition, but it's also uh, absorbing some of the lessons of uh, symbolism and the impressionists and so forth. Yeah, and 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 I think my argument, like again, if I were to argue and say, like, why um, why should we uh, keep the modernists in the canon? Is because, like I described it, like that acorn falling down from the tree. It is. It does still have its. Uh, it is born from tradition at the same time, or or again, large parts of it are, even if it then does kind of get warped and distorted beyond um, beyond reality as um, as time goes on and and all forms of tradition uh, are just, uh, are kind of abandoned. One thing I did want to mention, interestingly, about kind of subject again. And influence was the internationalizing element of uh, modernism, and again, this is that this is again something that isn't really talked about by um, trad like trad critics of modernism. But again, I, I think one of its biggest problems. So, for example, um, uh, Picasso and the Cubists were really interested by um, uh, African art, for example. Now, uh, a traditional artist would pull from. The work of their country or at least kind of like the local area you know obviously you'll have like french influence on english schools etc um but the modernists I, I would say massively expanded uh where they were drawing from so in some ways it's kind of like modernism is too traditional because it's not really come the stuff outside of the western canon that comes in and i'm thinking specifically here um gauguin with his uh you know drawing from um i forgot which island he's on uh, tahiti yeah tahiti thank you um but also the kind of use of um like african sculptures to kind of uh as, as ideas for forms so again one of my other criticisms for for modernism outside of subject is it's it has a form of traditionalism but it's kind of like that they're willing to take from anywhere in the world without questioning it whatsoever where, where again, I, I think there you encounter some really big problems uh, ideologically from um, abandoning the Western canon and then saying, "Look, this African piece of work is as valid as something that's come out of uh, a Western tradition." Yeah, I mean, this is something that Ian McGogan really kicked off. Um, this idea that you would, what what um, modernist uh, modernist artists who were sick of sort of academic painting of realist painting they went to non-western sources and said oh this is we can use this primitivism to revitalize european art um which has certain connotations let's say um and and it was and this is kind and this is problematic so it's like for example i was thinking about this idea of trumpton so if you've got the Trumpton, uh, which is like a shire, and you've got like a couple of towns, what are you going to be doing about the influence from outside? Are you going to be banning them? Are you going to be saying, you know, you can't, you can't look at art from outside, you can't have visiting artists? Because although um, we talk about uh, like the golden age of art maybe being, you know, like the 15th century, you know, Flemish painting, the Flemish primitives, for example. So, a, a sort of uh, painters like Van Eyck Van and, yeah. and yeah, Van der Weyden and all that lot. And you think, well, you know, they're, they're, they're quite local. Well, they were quite local, but there was actually quite a lot of travel between the cities that were in this sort of triangle between um, Antwerp, 
um, Cologne and Paris, and they were traveling a little bit between there. And they did actually travel quite far. And for example, Van Eyck made uh, diplomatic trips to the south of Italy and as far as Jerusalem. So there was actually a bit more travel and a bit more cultural exchange. Although, interestingly enough, this doesn't happen in terms of style. Van Eyck is still noticeably a Netherlandish painter, even though he's visited uh, mm. the Holy Lands and Southern Italy. So yeah. he, he does maintain his style. Just another example of that I, I can think of, and that is the use of uh, Islamic textiles in, in art, which is, a, which is a bit niche. But um, during the kind of um, late medieval and Renaissance period, um, Islamic textiles were um, uh, adored for their high quality. And what you'll find is if, if you investigate um, some of the pieces um, closely, you'll see kind of Kufic writing on some of the some of the clothes. So interestingly, you'll have like um, I'm thinking specifically of Bellini, where it's um, I think it's Mary and the Christ Child. Um, I, don't you, I don't know if you've seen this. Maybe I'll, I'll send it around in chat in a second. Um, but again, using this kind of international stuff. But I, I think the difference in my mind between traditional interactions with the world and um, the modernist is that the traditional always views the world through their like tribal lens, as as it were. Just like you said, where Van, Van Eyck's always seeing it as a you know as, as a Flemish person looking at the world, while a modernist almost becomes. Uh, or adopts that kind of local vernacular. Just as an, another point, I, I saw Owen in chat saying, uh, whilst the modern stick did expand international, and there have been a lot of Orientalist trends in history, especially in the UK and France. I'm glad you mentioned that, Owen, because the next series that Alexandra and I will be doing uh, will be on uh, Orient Orientalist art. But e even then, um, it's kind of like, it is always about the East and North Africa viewed from the lens of um, a Frenchman, and so it's it's romanticised. It's um, there are these kind of beautiful like white women in in um, these Oriental places. Um, it's it's not showing the kind of reality and truth of those cultures and traditions. And again, the the modernist abandons the self to adopt the the other and the outsider. And again, I think that's again why I, I have a problem with se several artists. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got, we've got this question about this division between the, the elites and the populists. I mean, like, if you, so a lot of high art was not made for the general population. Um, do we, do we think that that's a viable thing to say now? Um, can we, can we have a, an art style that's developed purely for the elites? Is that viable? Yeah, I, I mean, that there's been... T t like, again, I think when we're talking about the elites, you've got to talk about uh, who, like the utility of the art and also the kind of viewing of it. And, and again, a lot of elite art, certainly from a cultural perspective, was to kind of show off or to kind of show status. So, for example, um, you know, like if someone paid for a fresco in a church, right, you would mm. always include yourself... Um, could you just do a, a, just a Google for uh, Crivelli's Annunciation a second? Um, you'd always include your, yourself in the artwork. Um, so something like this is really interesting. So this is uh, Carlo Crivelli's um, work, and uh, it features the um, the bishop. Um, if, if you can zoom in on the, the left-hand side there. Um, so yeah, on, on the right is, is Mary, and she's kind of receiving the word of God. Um, you know, speaking about the Christ child that's to come. And there you have the bishop who commissioned the work. And again, it's the classic holding the uh, the city in his hand. Uh, and he's speaking to Gabriel d depicted um, with the lilies there. Um, so it's something like this is interesting because it's uh, an elite who has commissioned it, uh, it, but it's a populist work to kind of show off to the plebs that this bishop is, is uh, uh, you know, the boss. Uh, as AA said, it's, it's a massive form of virtue signaling, sort of. I, I think it is. I think it is deeper than that as well, because the bishop would have a, a care for his parishioners. This is about making. It's about teaching them a story and also them tr trying to get them to transcend as well, as opposed to just a pure propaganda poster. Yeah, and also you could say it's an act of charity because he's 
he's donating this work to the to his um, parish because, of course, um, this was going to be on display in the cathedral or the church, and it would be available to people on usually on holy days. That uh, often these um, altarpieces were closed up, so they had um, the wings were closed over them, and they usually had sort of and these were designed to look like um, uh, stone sculpture, and that these were opened on holy days uh, and on Sundays. Um, so that the the um, the population could see this great work of art, but they would only see it briefly. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's like um, forced restriction of, of of viewership. And again, I think that that's a really interesting point with society today. We almost have there is like okay, there's there is too much art, and there's too much accessibility to art. Where again. Um, <laughs> You know, AA describes that feeling of going to nature and then he says, oh, it's just something like I've seen in a video game. I think a lot of people have just had, has seen so much stuff that um, they're kind of, they're kind they've of been overwhelmed. Numbed, yeah. yeah, that's it. They, they, they've been numbed. Um, but I think that the, the saving grace that art has is that it, it you cannot capture um, everything perfectly in a di digital photo. So for example, this is a, a tempera painting. And what's interesting about tempera is that it's a translucent medium. It, it uh, lets light through. So if you, I don't know if you can zoom in any further or uh, look. No, can, this is it. Okay, um, can you scroll down a second and look at his hands a second? Um, the way, can, can you see that uh, Gabriel's hands, you can sort of slightly see some of the brush strokes in mm. there as Crivelli has built up. Oh, you, can actually, you can actually best see them at the side on, on the bricks. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah take take a look there. Yeah. So he's added the shade, and um, so uh, tempera is of course uh, pigment suspended in an egg yolk medium, and when it dries, it has a slight translucence, meaning that um, you can see from one layer to another. So there is actually a, a physical depth to the painting, and um, the way that we see color uh, and the actual painting itself is different physically than the di digital copy. The digital copy takes all of that translucent, it averages it, and it says, you're a pixel of this color now. And, and so you will never get the same experience um, seeing something on, a pi on, on your screen as when you see it physically. I thought maybe we should, uh, uh, we, should con we could contrast this, this, this act, uh, this uh, great work of art that was uh, donated to uh, the church uh, for the ennoblement of the the people and uh, the city and uh, to praise god and compare that to art of today yeah like 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 in, in my mind this is this is where i think again there is a, a big uh dividing line between modernists and the postmodern and I, and I think there's there's one interesting thing here as well is that a lot of the early modernists particularly were taught in uh, the traditional method. Again, I think Owain, from an architectural perspective, has got a real bee in his bonnet about um, someone like Cabusier being being taught in the classical style, um, which I, which I think is a really interesting notion. But but I guess the point I'm trying to br bring up is that those early modernists, even though they were expending, exp um, they had broken the rules, they had broken the tradition, were happy to do any kind of subject. They still had um, traditional skills. They still had um, that treat teaching and training in, in that way. So, for example, if you see the works, the um, the kind of early works of Pablo Picasso, for example, <clears throat> he could do realism. He is like he could he could d do it with the best of them, but he chose not to do that. While as soon as you can kind of reach the kind of sixties and seventies because of what I think is basically like, you know, training training from that kind of Bauhaus mentality, which always aims to build from um, ex nihilo. Um, you have generations of artists who weren't, didn't have that traditional training. And it starts to hit in about the kind of 60s and 70s points from where uh, you kind of, you draw the, the line of the canon. And yeah, you end up with um, something like this. I don't, I don't know what your, your viewpoint on it is. Uh, not... <laughs> Uh, I'm not very I'm not very pleased with it, but obviously this this falls into the into the 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 sort of that the populist anti uh, anti modernist thing of oh look at it it's just a bunch of junk it's just a bunch of scaffolding oh, look how ugly it is you know it's all sort of stupid angles and it looks like a toy and and they're not entirely wrong but I would say the problem is you want realism today you're going to get this. 
Okay, you're going to get so, this. So cursed. This is so um, good. There's, there's so many. There's so many. We need a parody Twitter account, like realist artists posting their L's. We've got what was it, the, <laughs> the Ronaldo sculpture. We've got this. We've got the Princess Diana one as well. Just so, so many. Be careful what you wish for, trads. This is what's coming. If you say no modernism, we just want something realistic. Well, this is technically realistic. So this is a sculpture by someone called Gillian Waring, and she was part of the young British artist movement. So you know, like Damien Hirst and Sarah Lucas and Tracy Emin. And she's she's a conceptual artist. She's a new media artist, photographer, video person, and she she can't sculpt. But this is her sculpture because, of course, she employed some technicians to make this. She, she, she can't sculpt. She, um, she just simply um, delegated a, a studio, a technical studio, which made a model and that, that was passed to a foundry and they cast this in bronze. And it's literally a suffragette holding up a message. Um, it, it couldn't, you know, it couldn't be more simple. Okay, a lot of people in chat are saying, what's the problem with this piece of work? How, how would you crit critique it from an artistic perspective? Um, well, um, how about this? Which, which looks, which is more ennobling? Which, more, which, which is more exciting? Which captures the spirit that you want to transmit to your people? And this does it beautifully. Can you see any words? Can you see any words written on it? No, because it's embodied in the form. It embodies the virtues of classical strength and resilience in a beautiful work of art, which extends back to the foundations of European civilization. And it does it beautifully and it does it wordlessly. And you end up at this, this sort of honking clown car, clanking, vehicle and and again i think this this is this is why um you got to be really careful with with definitions and I, and I think in some ways this isn't a traditional piece of art because it is not drawing on a particular tradition it hasn't this this is like a soulless piece of art this it's um like again i think the fact you're having to kind of show courage through like a na uh, a napkin that this woman's holding up, <laughs> yeah. Um, while David holds uh, courage in his stature and in his face and in, and his smile, and again, it's just for me, this is just it's it's a dead work. And and again, I think this is this is some of the problems you get into with um, again going all the way back to, to V's point again. What V try has tried to do is to say that um, traditional art is x which is realism but you end up with stuff like this which is kind of like well this is neither traditional nor good art yeah, yeah that, that again just like yeah the the, the 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 gesture is very very stiff there's a lifelessness to it look at the face there is no emotion like do you do you feel yeah. the courage from her face there's you, no like, uh, it's and and the thing is that the, and there's no and you and you talked about uh, how Michelangelo so cleverly altered the dis altered the um, the proportions, and you had the drama, you had the you know the the sort of the the, the virile power, and you had um, the sort of slight instability, and you've got some motion, you've got some action, and here you've just got literally a scan. It's pretty much it's a scanned figure, three D printed, and then cast in bronze. I mean, it's just so static and lifeless. Uh, there's someone in chat uh, said a really interesting line there. If you want realism back, we'll have to wait 50 years or longer for artists to rediscover lost skills. And, and again, I think there's a really interesting point there where um, I genuinely think that uh, traditional art is, you've got to go back to this idea of the tree. It's a process. It's a organic growth. And what, what has happened is the tree has been felled so to so to speak mm. and we got we got to like we got to start again and and again people a, a lot of what i see about people trying to go back to tradition is again you sort of end up in a bit of a situation like this where again it's it's a lifeless and cold mirroring of the past as opposed to 
uh, an organic growth from the past. And there's a real key differentiation yeah. um, there. That being said, I think there is value in um, like trying to learn from the past at the same, same time. So, for example, when the Royal Academy first uh, opened, they would only um, draw from what they described as the antique sculptures, um, frescoes, and um, relief plaster works. Cast. Yeah, and, and plaster casts of, of those things. Um, and, and again, um, Reynolds, who was the first president of, of the RA, had a number of lectures, and, and he was a big advocate of saying, look, when you, when you're thinking about tradition you got to you got to got to draw from somewhere and that and that could literally be like aping and copying the past until you've picked up those skills that you can kind of continue on beyond there and again i think there's something interesting about where uh, if again one of the points that aa had at the event was uh, around larping and actually you know maybe we need to to larp a little bit to um um to kind of re-establish those roots before you can grow organically. But I agree, going back to that commentary, I, I agree. It's, this this is not good art. And I, we effectively have to start again to grow organically. And I wonder whether we'll even be able to uh, work in the same mediums as the great artists of, of tradition. You know, I, I, f I feel like all, uh, all art mediums have a natural trajectory. Um, you know, like what... <laughs> Um, maybe the time of oil painting and sculpture is over and maybe it's time for something else. Well, I would say, yes, by all means, revive tradition, by all means, revive. And I would say this is something that goes back to the heart of uh, art education. So if you're going to have a, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say you'd need an art school in Trumpton. You might need a couple of master craftsmen um who would be able to have apprentices and they would be able to train and pass on the traditional skills to their apprentices who would in turn become masters and so you might have a, a guild society you know like a, uh, you might have a guild or something um i mean you like for example what would you but i mean i would say you, you, but you wouldn't start from this point that this is this is um this is a conceptual artist delegating an idea to um, uh, to, to a, a place that scans stuff in 3D and then getting it um, reworked by um, uh, master master craftsman at a foundry. So this you wouldn't start you wouldn't start from this point. So I mean, what what's what's your what's your view on the idea of guilds and apprenticeships? Um. I'll jump in a second. I noticed that the the lurker has returned. <laughs> oh, okay. I I've been oscillating between like literally lying in bed, sweating, and being like, I actually want to be on the stream. Uh, but um, one of the, I mean, I would never be as arrogant to call myself an artist in any single way. But um, I have, you know, I have been doing like my own little experiments recently on on AA radio, which I know is a small thing, and it's not really like I would never call it art, but. <clears throat> while I've been in the process of doing that, you know, I've been taking, um, you know, German, like a lot of my videos are basically just German experimentalist 20, 1920s silent films uh, and derivatives thereof, and then splicing it with like, you know, I don't know, a kind of trash punk song from the late 70s and seeing what happens in those, in those spaces. And um, I, like, I've been thinking, well, there's something like I find there's something interesting. It's very postmodern, but there's something interesting in that, where you have a situation where you're putting these elements together, and then you have an audience that doesn't even understand the original reference point, which is of interest to me. Right? It's like, well, all of these things are like these are classic works that somebody would somebody would know, but reconstituting them in these kind of new ways and putting them together with unexpected elements then produces something that could only exist now does that make sense like i find that interesting like the the, the things th those things that i'm putting together they are completely inauthentic from a point of view they're there's they're completely secondhand they require no artistry um they require no actual fil filmmaker other than the, the rediscovered archival text okay uh, and the and the original mu mu musician but 
uh, in a strange way, they are authentic to now. Does that make any sense? And I, I'm just wondering, like, why can't I mean, the, the, you you at the start of the stream, uh, Alexander, you said, well, postmodernism is the is the true enemy, but like, surely that is a style of postmodernism. And what is what is wrong with the how can I say um, the, the rediscovered 1920s film in 2020, literally a hundred years later, uh, looks very different from the from from the way it would have looked at the original at the original time, especially, especially if you present it in a context where um, it's kind of un it's kind of unexpected. Does, does that make any sense? Um, yeah. and, and, and so I'm, I, I've become increasingly interested in, uh, how can I say, um, the, the extent to which the new, a new context transforms an original text. And this is actually something that we've talked a lot about on the Warhol streams with D. I mean, I, I think Andy Warhol was a contextual artist in this way. Um, so, yeah, any thoughts on that? Um, I would say, yes, you're correct. I mean, everything you've said is correct. But I would say, beware, there's a, a problem with reprocessing and reprocessing in that you tend to get less nourishment from each cycle. Um, and it becomes, you're getting you're getting less vitamins from this material that's being recycled and you're becoming more detached and more um not necessarily self-referential but sort of uh, sort of con contextual dependent even though i know yes. of course that when, when you're encountering these things for the first time as some people will be for like i presume you're using like hans richter uh, animations from the 1920s mm -hmm. the they, they they seem very fresh and exciting because they're sort of you know they're so grainy they're so jerky they're mm -hmm. black and white and so forth um so i would say yes in a way it does work fine but beware of um becoming too detached from um but, reality but, i mean i i see you see this in i mean i, I don't want to get too like you see it in video like there's a video game i've never played it but the 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 concept is really interesting you're playing an rpg right rpg video game but the game itself moves through moves through the uh the ages of the rpg so like you know one levels like zelda one next mm. next bit you're in the 16-bit world and um i mean I, it's almost like you're in this you know spengler talks about the end of creativity because everything's been deconstructed and nothing new can be made but I, I just wonder about the the extent to which you can always reconstitute the past, um, um, and that in itself gives it energy. I mean, the the, the area I point to where that this has been done a lot, okay, for good or for ill, is uh, performances of Shakespeare, for example. Mm. I mean, I, I I don't know how many times something like Hamlet or King Lear has been staged. But you can guarantee that basically there'll be three or four productions every single year in London, like going back, you know, decades and, you know, going back to the 19th century at this point. Mm. When you're getting to the point where you've got, you know, that many productions of the same play, you're, you're, you're really coming up against, well, how, how can we get anything new out of this text? You know, how can, like, there's already traditions of playing this, playing this part or playing that part. Um, and yet they still somehow manage it. It still somehow manages to be like endlessly, endlessly innovative, even though it's, it would appear like it's flogging a dead horse. Um, so I, I do want, I just do, I just wonder about this. Uh, how can I say it, to reject, to reject what I've just said, it almost seems to, um, then posit a situation where you're looking for endless novelty, endless novelty all the time. You, you worried about the novelty of the mm. 1920s silent, silent film we wearing out. But in in a, in a way, the the text is not the 1920s silent film or the Shakespeare play. It is what the, what happens to those elements now in 2021, and you know that's kind of a fleeting thing because in 10 years time that will look very different as well but then but then it creates a, it creates a new thing again because it's like well what does this 
thing that looked like in 2021 looked like in 2031. Does that make any sense? Maybe I'm not making any sense. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that because you're looking at it through your own eyes and you're setting it in the context of what you know about films and music and so forth and animation, that this makes it fresh for you. Um, yeah, I, I agree that is true. And, and for example, like this, this for example, this um, construction in London is actually developed from um, Tatlin's Soviet uh, work. So uh, you, 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 you do get this thing of, of people uh, reconstituting stuff. Here, here it's, 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 it's actually transforming it into a different work of art. But in your case, yes, it would be um, uh, appropriating it and, and recutting it. But well, well, I guess what I'm saying is, I mean, in terms of this idea of modernism, traditionalism, you know, in a way, something that is so intertextual and so rooted in reference is inherently tied back to the culture in a way in a way that endlessly seeking novelty or endlessly or, or just trying to reproduce the past is not so so i mean i don't know i swing back and forth i i swing back and forth on it but i i've always thought that there's a kind of i, don't, I know everybody here hates hip-hop for example i like hip-hop but one of the reasons i like hip-hop is that is the discovered kind of like Oh, like how that producer that producer has managed to take an old jazz record, or a, you know, frequently it's like a like a Motown song, and they've taken th four moments of that, and now it's spun into this new thing, and the and and the new the new generation who doesn't know that that's happened experiences as a as a new thing, but then if they really study the new thing, they can rediscover the old thing within it, um, and 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 I think there's something exciting about that journey and process that um those sorts of uh those sorts of texts and those sorts of artworks can can make but i realize i'm sounding like michel foucault here so <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> um i I'm, I'm not quite sure but i i think some kind of you know you mentioned around the fusion some kind of traditionalist modernist fusion is necessary and i and i am of that viewpoint as well i think um a pure embracing of tradition and you sort of end up in a bit of a cul-de-sac um well but then like i said with the modernists they are inherently rootless they are inherently subversive typically um and so you it's if you go down that path it is the destruction of the self and the nation through um, artistically and culturally, um, so. But but what, why can't you keep them alive? Why 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 can't I don't know? I mean, I'll give you I'll give you a very random example, like um, like something as asinine as being around the world by Puff Daddy and Notorious B.I.G. In a strange way, is introducing a new audience to David Bowie and bloody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whoever else was sampled on that record was it or uh, at least a stansfield <laughs> but then like imagine the rap fan who then goes backwards and gets into bowie and then discovers do they they do they they it's kind of it's, kind of, it's, well, it's, it's no, possible it's, 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 it's like when Kanye used king crimson for that for that for, for that song like no no one is going to check in and then suddenly become a proper fan I, I, they... I bet you king crimson <laughs> enjoyed a, a kind of renaissance um, Only from people who knew the song originally. Like, I'm, okay, I'm, okay, I'm just imagining a, a, a waft of Chicago uh, African Americans really into prog music after listening to uh, Kanye so much. I just, I just don't think it's gonna, gonna, gonna happen. I, I think there's a genuine problem around this rootlessness that you end up with. With um, how is that? I mean, my question is, how is this inherent? Into, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think of myself more like a kind of, um, what was that film with John Cusack in it? Uh, 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 I forget now, you know, the one in the record shop where they've got, you know, they've all got their hundreds and hundreds of records and they're coming up with their top 10 list and all that sort of thing. Like that's very much the, the generation. Nick Hornby like, thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The Nick Hornby, uh, yeah, high fidelity, yes, high fidelity yeah. is what I'm thinking of. Or like Tarantino, right? Tarantino, 
who makes films that are always secretly about films and there's something like the entire history of like you know b movie subgenres happening at the same time uh, <clears throat> and yeah okay you can get a player who watches the tarantino movie uh, who doesn't pick up on any of that but if you really get into it you'll be like you, you then discover like hundreds of other texts through like once you really understand what tarantino's doing and in my mind, that is rooted in tradition. That is kind of. I, I mean, you, you, you're right. That is that is what traditional, uh, you know, artists have done as well. So, for example, the use of symbology of um, specific forms and or, or poses makes reference to other previous artists that only those in the know w would know about. But, uh, um, but, like, but I, I think yeah. there is a differentiation between postmodernist approach, which. I, I feel like it's kind of like um, sort of picking up parks from a carcass to create a Frankenstein style like monster. It, it, it attempts right. to reconstruct uh -oh. man out of um, the components of man, as opposed to it, as, as opposed to the, the traditional viewpoint, which is creating man through childbirth. Uh, but I, I don't. I mean, I genuinely don't don't un understand this because. You know, as somebody who studied, for example, early early modern literature, you know, I, I, we mentioned Dr. Faustus or Shakespeare or any of those playwrights, they were constantly doing the same thing. They were plundering, and and they were and they did this thing of backhanded showing off, where characters were you have whole conversations which are actually lifted from other parts, and you know you have to like, you know, if you pick up your very very scholarly edition of the Norton Shakespeare or something. You'll be like, oh, this line is from Plato. This line is from, uh, oh, this line is taken from Seneca. This line, and I mean, that's not explained. And the the, the guy chucking tomatoes down in the, you know, the groundings aren't going to pick up any of those references. But the kind of, um, you know, the university intellectuals of that time, they kind of nod knowingly. They'd know, well, well this bits from the Bible. This bits from Greek, 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 Greek. And that was the Renaissance man. You know, the but, wearing but, the learning on the sleeve. That, that's how what, is that's what, that? How no, is but that's, that? That's what I'm saying. Is that like, yeah. but but reference itself is traditional. But I, I think there is a differentiation between this. Is what I was saying about the plundering of the components of man, as opposed to um, the organic growth of of man. And I think what postmodernism, because of that international element, firstly, is that it will pilfer from anywhere and not care about it. It will pilfer any subject and not think about the consequences of it. And in the same way, do, like, like, ha, do you do you, do you think, ha, um, like, did, did Shakespeare or Marlowe put in stuff that was that went against the crown, for example, or like slagged off Elizabeth Didn't, behind well, her back? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll give you a good. I'll give you an example. Um, Richard the uh, Second, famously, Elizabeth Elizabeth the First said, "I am Richard." No, ye not that, um, and uh, the the uh, uh, the Essex Rebellion on the eve of the rebellion to g up the, the crowd. They played Richard the Second. They played. They paid Shakespeare's company to play uh, Richard the um, Second. Elizabeth knew what was going on, and then um, and then when she had Essex executed, um, you know, and the rebellion was thwarted. They paid Shakespeare's company again to come and play Richard the Second again as a kind of couple fuck you. Um, so, so it's it's not like um, it's not like these sorts of things. There, there is some, like there's a way in which you can always read uh, various art scenes that were going on and subversive, you know. Um, and people did. I mean, you know, the Puritans shut the theaters down because they were seen as fringe spaces where, where you had cross-dressing and undesirable types of people and and in a way this kind of like i mean does it not come with a turf of art i mean we talked about this before at the event alexander mm. you're never going to get be able to get rid of the of the underground in any in any culture um you know but yeah at, at this current time we're against the power regime so we should be the underground type thing. Well, it's yeah, yeah, it's 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 this question of like, um, you know, that you want obviously you want you want to you want to have a vanguard. You want to you want to push the boundaries. You want to present your 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 um, yeah. 
your uh, values and you want them to become the elite values but then obviously you want to stop the vanguard then and you want to freeze it in the same way that you know like as soon as stalin comes to power it's like oh suddenly we're going back to traditional learning and uh, the abortion laws and the divorce laws are completely abolished and uh, yeah that's all yeah. gone I, I mean I, I i didn't want to crash the stream by coming in with like you know art postmodernism but i mean somebody's saying in the chat you know yeah, Shakespeare can be a value without being an expert in Plato. But, I mean, how is that different from some, like, everybody loved Pulp Fiction in 1994. Hardly anybody knew the bloody grindhouse tradition that he was coming out of, or the bloody obscure kind of, you know, they weren't even B-movies. They were like, Tarantino was into some really scuzzy, scuzzy kind of films. Um, you know, it was only like the, the, the true, like, film nerds, and <laughs> Even then, the kind of appreciators of, of like, you know, exploitation movies that could uh, pick up on all the stuff that Tarantino was doing. But many audiences watch Pulp Fiction. I mean, I remember watching Pulp Fiction with my mother. She thought it was hilarious. She's going to miss all those references. So, I mean, I don't want to make this just about Tarantino. I'm just wondering why the postmodern and why notions of ref reference and are inherently seen as being subversive or detached or why can't they be rooted? You know, um, I think of Bob Dylan. I mean, I've talked about Bob Dylan a lot. He's got an album called Love and Theft, where basically every single line on Love and Theft is a quotation or stolen from some other song or some other novel. Um, I know it's a great album, but it's very postmodern. Um, and all of Dylan is like that. All of Dylan is a, is a quotation, basically. Um, but if you sat him down and say, well, how, what? why are you stealing lyrics, Dylan? He'd just say, well, what's folk? What's what's blues? Everybody stole everybody else's stuff. Mm. That's what art has always been. So, yeah, in, including yeah, including T. S. Eliot. Yeah, whereas I mean, I, I would I try to the pinnacle of Canto. modernism. Yeah, exactly. So, mm. what is in a way? I just I just question this, um, you know, traditionalism, modernism, postmodernism. But when you move it beyond the the sphere of just like visual art into you know, into 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 all these other forms that we're talking about. I'm not sure if I see that. I'm just not sure if I see that hard distinction in the same way. Why can't you have a canon that has a place for, um, has a place for Dante, uh, as well as, <laughs> as well as Quentin Tarantino? Like, what's the what's the problem? <laughs> uh, well, no. I mean, and for, if this was this was actually exactly what I said during my speech. It was and. If people look at my essay on the canon, which is in culture war, they will see that I say, you cannot control the canon. You cannot keep stuff out. If it becomes acclaimed enough, it becomes influential enough. If it becomes imitated, then it automatically becomes part of the canon, whatever a traditionalist or even a modernist would say or want, because it's an aggregative system. There is no single authority. Um, and so this is something that you what people would just have to accept that if it becomes famous enough, then it will become part of the canon. Okay, I've, I've been thinking about answering your point, and, and and again, I think for me, so I think there's a really good point here, which is, are there really any um, differentiations between traditional, traditional, modern, and postmodern art. And, and and in my mind, I think the lines between traditional and modern are very, very, very blurred. And I think you're, you're right, AA. But I do genuinely think that there is a line in the sand with postmodernism with where with, with, with around the deconstruction ideas, while both of the, the previous art movements attempt to build something up, the, the modernists, as I, as, as I said, almost kind of like as a parallel um movement but postmodernism it, it's never trying to build or it, um like because it's all because it's always great. detached and ironic it's never it's never it's never genuinely a canon because it's always mocking itself it's always critiquing yes. itself it's always deconstructing itself it never genuinely means anything and and so i think any <laughs> Any civilization that would adopt that as as its kind of artistic mode would be, you know, culturally a dead letter. You know, never being able to grow, never be able to to, to get like um, to become more. And, and I think we, 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 we are we are a civilization 
in that kind what? of post post postmodern age that hasn't grown culturally. <laughs> I, I just don't understand though why the why the new postmodern art object can't be a new thing in in and of itself. So yes, you've taken elements from you know uh, different places, but you but what you end up with is something entirely new and something that could have only been born now, but something which also is acknowledges the fact. Um, and you see, I, you see, I think there's a kind of humbleness in it. You're acknowledging the fact that you're standing on the shoulders of giants all the time. Um, you know, Eliot. You mentioned T.S. Eliot. He has that famous essay about the great tradition, and you know that a writer is always uh, kind of writing with the shoulder, you know, with the with these great figures like Dante and Shakespeare and whoever, whoever else mm. looming over his shoulder, and that he writes with that. In you know, he, he can't get away from that anxiety. Of it. You know, they call it the what are the, the anxiety of influence, right? But why, like? But, but again, you, you, you're you conflating the modernist and the postmodernist era, and I think yeah, you, the, you, again, I, 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 this is what I'm saying. I, I'm agreeing with you. I, I think the, the modernists <coughs> do have an arguably um, uh, traditional and co canonical um, um, p position, but the, the the reason why is it's, it's the the postmodernists are never creating out anything outside of the the boundaries of uh, what they do. It's always about, um, like again with, with Elliot, yes, he's standing on the shoulders of giants, but he's he's reaching up to the sky. While you, even when the postmodernist stands on the shoulders of giants, it's to hit the giant in the face with a club and, and look downwards. You know, it's about um, tearing down that um, that that order. But I mean, I, I, I don't want to. I, I, I'm just even Tarantino because it's the one that's coming to mind because he's probably the one that. Most is, 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 is Tarantino but, post postmodern? I, I, I mean, I'm not really. A I, film I, I mean, I, I would, I, I would, I would suggest that he is a, a quintessential postmodern artist, right? Okay. Um, I mean, to which I'd say if you if you picked up any book on like postmodern film, you know, Tarantino would be would be discussed, right? Because. Um, you know, you're saying, well, T.S. Eliot reaches upwards and he's still trying to find, like, capital T truth. Yeah, you know, mm. um, w w uh, he still believes in, in, in man in some way. Whereas in Pulp Fiction, you know, uh, you know, he op they, open the, they open the suitcase and they're, they're staring at the, the shiny thing in the suitcase. Uh, but the kicker is, like, it means nothing at the end of the day. Like, the film is not going to give you whatever that mystery is, and and you remain locked outside of it. Um, so it's, but, it, it's truly postmodern in that sense. But I would still say that in I can't think of um, an artist who um, who has always got the anxiety of influence in mind because he can't help himself but uh, speak in a language that is already kind of handed down. Like in you know, uh, so I, but, I just but, don't. But, but haven't yeah. you just summed it up right there? Where, where again, um, you know, the, the moderns are looking upward, while again the postmoderns are, look, are looking down. I think I think you've summed it up purpose, perfectly. There is that nihilistic element to it, and while again, yet you're right, you are reconstructing and creating something something new. It will never go. It will never go beyond. It will never transcend. And you, like I said, you end up but in a cultural cul de sac. Because, like you said, because it's by by, it, by its nature, like like you said, um, it, it 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 veers veers towards that point because because of the ideology behind it. Okay, Alexander, any thoughts on this? I, I didn't want to derail you guys too much. I just well, uh, well I've, yeah. I've I've got my speech here from the event, and um, I'm looking at that sentence. So I, I said. Um, I talked about three iron laws, and I said the first one is uh, artistic and social change has a history of accelerating leftism, collectivism, and statism. Two, that the establishment co opts, normalizes, and commercializes subversion, integrating this into products and institutions. And three, that the canon recognizes outstanding and innovative achievement, even subversion. Uh, and I suppose we could also add, you know, uh, repurposing and recontextualizing and sort of composting. Yeah, uh, and but, these but, and these are, these are unavoidable. And traditionalists just they have to accept that these things will happen. They might fight against them. They might want to continue continue their own tradition. They might want a more vital, realistic, or um, an art form that's more drawn from life directly from life. 
but you have to acknowledge these three iron laws because I don't think they are avoidable. I think that you just have to, you might, you might dissent, you might want to choose do something different, but you have to accept that they do exist. I, I, I have to duck out again, folks. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, to, <laughs> sorry for interrupting you so much. No, no, no that's okay. Um, yeah. Well, I, again, I, I I agree with the points, but then I think it's again, any civilization has to adopt one of those three. Um, intellectual frameworks for its artistic and cultural communities mm. the traditional the modernist and the postmodernist yeah like i said and, I, and, like... and and so we have we have a typical example here so this is the vanguardism of the soviet art in 1920 which lasted um only a few years after the revolution and by the mid 20s they were already they had already decided that they wanted something more like this so this is 1930 lenin at the small institute and this is sort of seen seen as one of the foundations of socialist realism, um, where the where the uh, where the revolutionary Bolsheviks decided, well, actually, we're not going to be as revolutionary as we said because it's alienating the um, the proletariat, as it were. So we're going to go back to something more realistic. Um, and so here you see that the realism is being. Per, uh, sort of um, adopted for an authoritarian leftist position. And you find that also the, the other dictatorships that we discussed in our three-part stream also went down this route of having a more realistic um, strand to them and aban abandoning sort of pure modernism. I think it's interesting for people who are traditionalists to look at these and think, um, you know, is, is this the proper course for us? Mm. Um, so, and this is this is uh, this is the sort of um, semi-realistic work that you would get. So, this is in um, Dresden, and this is the sort of art that uh, covered the Eastern Europe. And it's like, well, uh, is I mean, I'm not necessarily against this work. I don't I don't find it offensive, and I don't find it unpleasant. But it's like, well. Do we want this in Trumpton? I don't know. Yes, gigantic Soviet. I want. I want giant Trumpton murals everywhere, <laughs> <laughs> just highlighting the traditional and traditional values and hierarchy of Trumpton. Um, yeah, I'll. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. So, so this is so this is going to be um, the central the central statue of uh, Trumpton. This is AA. This is the mayor. Yeah. This is, no, this is AA in gold. Yeah. He, he will be made. You'll be made out of gold, and the citizens will file past and lay flowers at the base of his plinth. Yeah. So this is um, uh, what's his face now? Um, the 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 dictator of the late dictator of uh, Turkmenistan. Don't know, sorry. Yeah, so so this is um so uh, so this was made around two thousand. So this is an example of um, authoritarian realism, uh, sort of from the socialist realism tradition. Yeah, and and again, I guess that's sort of smashing conceptions around realism and traditional art as well. So yeah, I mean, I I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not I'm not I'm not picking on these to dunk on them, but you know, I mean, it's just like if you say you want realism, I mean, you do you know what realism is do you know how realism is used i don't think i don't think i think that realism is pretty much relatively val uh, value neutral because you can use it uh, in terms that are uh, you know quite honest or you could use them in ways that are quite propagandistic um i don't um you can per use it to different purposes and it's the purposes and the themes and the content that are more uh, of interest and more variable. Realism itself as a style, I don't think tells you anything in particular, um, morally or ideologically. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so this is an example of Mao. So this is Mao founding the nation. 
Chinese painting from 1953. So I think I think we discussed this before, didn't we? I don't think not this specific one, but again, similar yeah, similar ideas. Yeah. So it's just so the, these are examples of um, these are examples of um, realism. Um, here's another example of realism. But but again, I think again it's interesting because again, this is like non-realism, where again it's this like heroic comrade moment. Is it's it's trying to depict um, a moment that never existed to try and inspire ins inspire someone, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, th this is, um, yeah, so this is a painting from, well, this is a painting from the war years, so this is um, sort of 1940 to 1945, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's a very peculiar painting. Um, and I was just including this as an example of um, art as propaganda. So, I mean, I know that AA has talked a lot about, you know, like, well, propaganda isn't necessarily negative because um, you could say that um, uh, you could say that um, David is propaganda for the Florentine state. And I yes. don't think anyone would argue against this being a, yep. a beautiful, ennobling, a wonderful work of art that is one of the pinnacles of Western civilization. Um, and it is propaganda uh, made by one of the greatest artists who was also extremely independent and headstrong and had lots of arguments with his patrons and was very uh, cussed. Uh, so this is all this. So both, so both of these works are both propaganda. Um, what do you think? Well, again, it's, it's going back to my uh, point around uh, traditionalist views on culture is that culture moves people. You know, it gets them to do to do things, whether that is a propaganda poster directly or um, a, a statue. And so, yeah, like, like uh, I think you're right. It's it's a proper it's propaganda for showing the magnificent magnificence and wealth of um, the Florentines, but it's also a form of heroic propaganda where you're you're challenging people to look upon the face of heroism and uh, bravery and courage and to inspire it in themselves, you know. So it, it, the utility of this artwork is interesting because it's, it has got that kind of, um, I guess, materialistic propagandic value to it, showing, look, aren't we clever, aren't we smart? We've got the best artists. But it's also, it does have, it ha holds the transcendent qualities of good art, which is, um, you know, it, this is a depiction of what, you know, beauty looks like. This is a depiction of what um, t to be a, a a destroyer of enemies is like. Yeah, um, and also I think this this gets down to the question of uh, the division between Athens and Sparta. So Athens was, of course, this great center of enlightenment and culture. It was cosmopolitan. It traded widely. It had the Delian League or the Athenian Empire, however you want to characterize it, and it was noted for its art. And of course, it was perpetually in conflict with Sparta, which was a closed isolationist civilization, which um, had very little art, um, very little culture. It was a martial society. It was um, designed for the creation of soldiers, of helots, um, and they were very good. They were they were the best. Uh, they were the best soldiers. The Athenians had the best navy, of course. And it's a it's a double um, approach. So it's like, which society do you want to be? Do you want Trumpton to be Athens, with its great art, but also its sort of openness to corruption and outsider influence and nomadism, or do you want to be Sparta, in you know, great, strong, martial society, but produces relatively little in the way of art? What do you think? Um, I'm not necessarily sure that openness equals art, and I'm not really sure. I would say that. I, I guess compared to Sparta, you would say that Athens is relatively, <laughs> relatively um, open. But I, I think again, it, it does ask some questions as to the, the place that art has in society. And again, in, in my mind, there's no doubt that the Athenians. Um, were an aesthetic civilization that prized 
um, that, that understood the importance of art, um, both from, um, again, a utilitarian, but also a transcendent perspective in conveying messages and inspiring, um, inspiring people. But, you know, I think you need that combination of both because ultimately Athens got trashed. So yeah, it had, it had to rely on the Spartans, didn't it? Exactly. When the, the Persians invaded, yes. So you, you probably can't go, you can't be like a purely aesthetic civilization, otherwise you will get beaten by just anyone. So, I mean, so what you're saying is that basically Trumpton would have to ally, it would be best to ally itself with a neighboring state which was friendly and which could do things that it couldn't do. No, like I like I said in the event, I think you just basically need to have access to a nuclear bomb. Basically, it would be totally lack of technology, and then you'd have a nuke as well. That's the you need that you need your uh, but you, yeah, you need your your strength and your power somewhere. So yeah, so you get you're going to be mining. So let, let's hope that Trumpton is based on a, a rich seam of uh, ore, uranium ore. Because well, yeah, so, yeah, would, we, I, I'm sure we'd be able to source it somewhere. You know. The carpenter would be able to. It would be the most aesthetic nuclear bomb. Let me just say, it would be like hand planed wood outer casing um, with a lovely, you know, it'd walnut be, veneer to it. So it'd be it'd be an aesthetic and artisan bomb. <laughs> it would be a craft craft bomb. Yes. Uh, so yeah. So so here's so this is one example of realism, and this is a slightly kinder example of realism. And uh, we're not trying to get AA's um, stream. Um, a channel uh, a strike or anything um because we we did we did this on your we did this on your stream and we had no problem so this is yeah. uh, an example of heroic um heroic mid-century german art yeah again and this like would, would you describe this as a modernist piece or a traditional piece uh i would say that th it's a weird fusion. I would say it's more traditionalist than modern. What would you yeah. think? Yeah, and, and and again, I, th I think this is this. There isn't really, the, in my mind, such a strong dividing line between the two because again, this is done by a like a, a an artist who clearly is drawing from some tradition. So again, the triptych layout. Uh, again, uh, the allegorical nature of it, the use of symbology and colours, etc. But again, the the kind of poses, the women that he's using inside it, the kind of the kind of green background, loads of this screams um, like a modern painting at the same time. So maybe we need to think about the uh, the traditional modern access as more of a graduation between um, the two. And and again, that's that's where I think you can't just say let us not um, accept any like modern art as, as a whole. I think you can reject individual artists um, for, for sure for, for either bad art or um, subversive art, etc. But to say that modern art is neither art nor canonical um, just doesn't make sense because how do you square piece, pieces like this which um, don't fit nicely between either school? Yeah, and so for example, so this is so the the mid-century Germans basically took the same line as the Soviets um, because the Soviets had socialist realism, and this is sort of that nationalist realism maybe. Um, and compared to this, this is this is a lot less realistic than mm -hmm. um, the uh, so the painting by. Uh, Adolf, Adolf Zeigler. So this is the four elements with fire, water, earth, and wind on the right, painted in 1937. Yeah. So, so it's, it's an interesting um, fusion. And you, again, you see a, a lot of that. Um, just just going back to V's point again, and um, with, with, his, with his meme, again, he got the dates to totally wrong, just as again, like a pedantic point where he's talking about how uh, it was after the Second World War where modernism, modernism was appreciated and obviously it was way before that, especially in elitist um, yeah. c communities um, and that's something I wanted to bring up as well, but again, like, like I said, the uh, you know, a, a key part of the losing, one of the losing side, the Italians, 
had mm. modernism at the heart of what, what they uh, did. Now, I, I think there is a dividing line between the Second World War and uh, before, but it's in the form of a, um, a again, this, this idea, ideas of internationalism where, uh, and again, this internationalism by its nature is a, an abandonment of the canon because to, to have a canon, especially a Western one, is to say that our works of art are greater than all others on the planet. It is a form of. Um, I, I, th I think it says it says it says we're different. Um, I think it, I, I think that's why the idea you can't have a world canon. A world canon doesn't make any sense because it's the idea of a canon is it's, it's an articulated story set in a discrete area. So you might have a British art canon. You might even have a. Uh, you know, a Scottish art canon or a European canon, but I don't think you can have a European and Asian canon or a world canon or an African and a South American canon working together. It doesn't work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, and, and you've got to think that this kind of realism is, is a reaction against the modernism uh, that um, the mid-century Germans were not very happy about. I mean, as we talked about on our stream, that um, a certain Austrian painter was extremely unhappy about modernism and talked about these, the changing styles, the hyper, the hyper, um, the, the the rapid acceleration and repeating of different styles of modernist styles was just a, a ridiculous um, fashion parade. And that it had to be abolished, and that people had to go back to their roots. And this was, and the art of the art that he promoted and the regime promoted was seen as um, uh, a bulwark against these rapid changing modernist schools. Mm. Yeah. Um, but again, even the artists within inside uh, his circle, again, I wonder if you presented some of their artworks, people would conflate them with modernist art, with, with modernist artists, or say it's it's modern art, not traditional. If that make, if that makes sense. So again, yeah. like I even think that kind of um, his analysis of the situation is um, wasn't that great, unsurprisingly. Oh well, yes, and of course it's kind of tied back as uh, into his origins as a painter. So, but anyway, I mean, I think. Um, it's worth me mentioning something like um, uh, Mexican muralism. So this was art produced by um, Mexican artists in the 1920s, starting in 1921 under the uh, under the social, starting under a socialist government. It came, it continued throughout the throughout the decades. And this was seeking to fuse modernism which was not entirely realistic with depictions of um history Tradition, and the people. Scenes, yeah. yeah yeah and and also with a degree of um yeah they were sort of amb ambivalent about religion because of course as the socialist government of course was atheist but i think obviously a lot of the population was actually christian mm. and strongly christian so they had like a difficult they they had a difficult bridge. So I think that they mainly stuck to civic subjects rather than any religious topics. Mm. And as you can see, so you've got a it's a it's a fusion of modernist mm. along with uh, lots of symbolism and uh, yeah, lots of uh, nationalist symbolism. The lurker is back. Hello, sorry. Hello. Sorry, sorry, folks. I was wearing the wrong headphones. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know uh, um, about uh, in terms of how we're going to uh, wrap this up, but I'm wondering if we should um, hit some uh, hit some super chats, um, um, or unless there was any kind of burning thing that you wanted to cover from here alexander no but, no i mean I, we can I basically I, talk indefinitely about this topic i i, I get the impression yeah, yeah so it's, it's basically so basically uh, to sum up i would say that uh the line between uh realism and modernism is not quite as uh straight as people suspect also equating um realism with tradition is not necessarily the case because uh, realism can be used in the service of many different things 
Uh, so that was basically it. I uh, I made a meme, by the way, while I've been gone. Do you want to see it? Yep. Oh, Can you see it? Oh, dear. <laughs> Quotes. Everything, everything in a frame. <laughs> but isn't that the case? I mean, if you had a postmodern dictatorship, it would... It would look like that. So we're not really building a statue to myself. We're kind of doing it knowingly. It You're doing getting, it ironically. We're doing it ironically. Yeah. So you just stick quotation marks around it. So, so you quite fancy that as a statue? For yourself? I think. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if if Trumpton had a statue and I was the mayor, I would demand quotation marks around the statue. <laughs> Uh, I possibly put the Aussie Man Diaz uh, quotation down the bottom as well. Nice. See, of... He's wearing he's wearing a he's wearing a tie. Yes, I've noticed that. Yes, I should maybe to take the tie off with it. But I, I like the cape. Tony you know. Blair. Tony Blair. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I also know Benjamin Rude uh, wanted to come on doing the doing the super chat, so he he may pop in because he is uh, he has rather strong views on this topic and uh, was particularly triggered by the stuff I was saying. Um, I get the impression he's more on your side of things, Pharaoh. Um, there's, there's rude. Um, I mean, just, just before I get to the, uh, super chats, why were you raging against Quentin Tarantino? So, so hard rude. What, what's the problem? <laughs> I wasn't, I was just <laughs> disagreeing with your characterization of it. You know, I, everybody loved Pulp Fiction. Well, okay. Did they? I don't know. I didn't. You know, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But, okay, but I mean, what I'm saying is, when um, when the history books are written, even in a hundred years, when it, when it comes to the 1990s in cinema, it's going to be Tarantino. Come what way? Is it? Oh, of, of course. Look, everything that Alexander said about how the canon gets determined over time is completely correct. There's nothing to debate or argue with on that front. Uh, what I, the, the difference is, this, what you were saying was that you were saying, oh, well, Tarantino's postmodern, so why can't, why can't if I just remix and cut together a few clips from an old movie and lay on yeah. a bit of and a bit yeah. of music, why isn't yeah. that equivalent? Well, it isn't because well, you know I, that... I wasn't saying no, no, no. What, what I was, what I was trying to say was. Not that my efforts on AA radio are in any way comparable to a Tarantino movie. Obviously, I would never suggest that. But the principle is the same. You're taking um, you're taking old materials and kind of reimagining them in a new context. And but that's not what the... he's doing at a at a formal level. That's not what he's doing. Well, he is. He's though, not he? just no, no. He's not just clipping. Is he? He's not just well, clipping okay, and right, grabbing yeah, like a peacock. I mean, he's yeah. actually making something anew. Like whether what, whatever my opinion of the standard of it is is neither here nor there. But it's not the same. This is not a substantive comparison. And when you say about Shakespeare I mean, to me, to me, and to me, Marlo, it's a distinction without a difference. Oh, pff, nonsense, rubbish. When if, if it makes, it makes you, no difference whatsoever. I mean, that's there's, there's almost no there's almost no shot in a Tarantino film that isn't taken somewhere else. Well, there's almost no shot from any film that it couldn't, couldn't, you couldn't point to another one and say it's not taken from something else. That's a meaningless point. But I mean, you, you've also, I mean, when it comes to this, you've, you've just shifted the goalpost a little bit uh, by saying, okay, well, um, a sound or a visual montage or, or collage is not the same as um, somebody taking a film out onto the location, having a massive yeah, production, that, that, uh, directing it, having not... all the lighting, having all the... no, is, it is not comparable. This is not. This is not. This is not a substantive rebuttal to the point I was making because all he's saying there is is that Tarantino is not the same as the stuff I've been doing. But the, the point, the points I was making about postmodernism and Tarantino or whoever else still stand, which is that they're rooted. They're, they're, they're intrinsically rooted um, in the culture already in a way that I think, I mean, um, uh, Pharaoh was talking about a tree that's fallen down and the, the acorns fall and new trees kind of grow and blossom out of the, uh, out of the. Sure. Out sure. Of the, I, I, now, I now don't, what, yeah. I don't um, regard him as just pissing. He's not, he's not, um, there's nothing about Tar Tarantino from my viewing of it 
that is disparaging or disrespectful towards the directors that have come before. In fact, you could you could easily say without any controversy whatsoever that he worships those, right? And in it, fact, his it, echoing it of those be, is worshiping them. If there was a criticism, you'd make it the other way that he's too aware and too in love with his with his influences. Yes, ag agreed, agreed. But but what I'm saying is, I don't think it's possible to argue that this is not a postmodern artist. I'm, I'm, I'm what I'm saying is, is that there is a there's a kind of revealed traditionalism within that process, because you're not you're you're inherently not discarding the past. You're making sure that I mean probably as a result. I mean I don't know for sure. Well, I, but probably the probably as a result of his films, there was um you know the the residuals of that probably kept certain like you know grindhouse horror scene alive in the in the two thousands and. You know, they probably got. You know, I, I reckon there were probably artists who got like uh, who were managed to win grants based on the fact of this, the renewed interest in this. But you know, and I, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, no, but I, I don't think yeah. I don't think that's at all what Firo is, is objecting to or pointing out. You well, know, so, I, what what is he object? I say I still don't understand the substance of the objection <clears throat> because I, I don't. Well, this this is from, I mean Firo. I don't know whether. It perhaps it's better that you speak to it, but if you'd rather me say, I will can say my, my perspective on it. You go for it. Okay. okay. Uh, I, I think the difference is, is there's a little bit of, there is, there is some degree of ambiguity, right? I think, for example, um, an artist, you could, a painter, perhaps you could, com you could compare who blurs the lines very, it would be Gerhard Richter. Right, who, in some the some things that he does, um, f fit quite quite neatly into the category of ugly postmodernism, but does that but does that describe the entirety of his work? No, not at all. There's actually, um, and in fact, he's you could say there's many of his works, particularly the um, um, the blur paintings that. Are, are very beautiful, extremely beautiful, and can be very and can be very moving. So I, yeah, this is the sort of the notorious stuff that's less interesting. It's it's more as he gets mm. later, and then also he will get, and also he will have has some very interesting three um, D sculptural glass work that can be very interesting as well, and and very beautiful. But it, it's <coughs> yeah. Well, but I guess the, what I'm trying to say yeah. is, is as I, I think. By choosing, by choosing film, it's a sneaky, not a like-for-like -like comparison, right? I mean, Why not? throughout well, because throughout all of this discussion, Pharaoh and Alexander have been talking about art in the in the in the purely pictorial and the classical forms, not in the twentieth century forms. And that's whereas, what what but hang on, hang it's on, just, it's just hang that film on. has got a shorter history. No, no, no. Film is a narrative form. It is not a purely pictorial form. What's the difference? It's still, oh I mean, I, I'm talking course, about... Well, there's a difference. You, can, the, the, you cannot... These are, these are distinctions without a difference when it comes to talking about, talking about artists playing with forms and how they relate to anxiety of influence. It doesn't, no. matter, if it's, it doesn't matter if it's art, uh, literature, film, or anything else. The principle is the same, and I don't understand what this distinction is. I mean, no, maybe, I can tell you, maybe all three of you disagree with me, but tell me what the difference I is. Can okay, I'll, tr I'll try my best. For a start, when something has narrative, and when I was going to, very, I kept trying to mention this before, which is that in the case of, say, Shakespeare or Marlowe referring to um, classical plays or... Um, um, or characters or events, like say, as you as you mentioned, from say, um, figures in the Bible. It it doesn't. There is no that isn't the value or the strength in it. The re the value or the strength in it is not the reference. Now it may be if to go back to Tarantino, the value and the strength in it to some wanker art critic, right? But that's just a cope because they're a textualist. Sorry, and not, and not, and they have no s sensuality. I mean, truly, that is the problem that you have. AA. It's like this I, is like I, you're no, saying when you're I, walking I down. Don't in the... I don't understand though, because if you take away the if you take away the reference, um, 
and the source material there is there is no Shakespeare. He was he he wrote no original stories. He wrote no original plays. Everything was sourced. Everything was taken from somewhere else. But that like my point is is that I how can I say I I question the fundamental uh, distinction between traditional, modern, and postmodern as being these hard categories. Because it seems to me that art has always has has, has always functioned in this way. Um, uh, yeah, you, you okay, just get that's fine. You just get moments where you get particular schools get stuck in dogmas for a period, but then something happens and you know you break out of them. Sure. I look uh, for my myself personally. I think there are only two categories: the religious art and the non-religious art. Beyond that, there aren't any distinctions. So, so, uh, it, but it's it's. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, what is the value of the point you are making and trying to break this down? Is it is it to say that, well, look, this is something that um, people who are, say, reactionaries or people who hate art and who aren't mm -hmm. who aren't educated in it, this is um, a cope um, distinction that, that they that they draw on? Is that is that your point? I mean, that well, seems I mean, like a valid point to me. Can, can, I, I, can, can, can yeah, I just jump in here as, as, a, as, a, as a challenge? And um, I think there is some I irony that you are trying to deconstruct those those <laughs> the, the, those boundaries in itself. Well, that, that that itself is a, a bit of meta commentary in, uh, in a post in the post mode. I mean, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Yeah, go on. Yeah. But but I, I guess my, my point in is is that when you look at the art from let's say you know the seventies or the seventies onward, mm -hmm. um, it is unlike anything that has come before. Uh, and just from an, an empirical point of view, how can you argue and say that um, this is not something that is new and novel because uh, for, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Alexander. N never has there been um, an artistic moment where so many art forms have been creative. Never that has there been so much self-critique. That there, there ha just hasn't been a time historically in the traditional canon um, where they've tried to, where, where they've accepted um, uh, artists who have tried to deconstruct things in the same kind of way. So I, I, I think. Yeah, I agree. You, 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 it's, it's become it's become hypercharged. Mm. Yeah, the, 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 there is the, the, you have to, just physically looking at it. I, I see what you're saying, and I think there's some really interesting points around. Um, maybe it isn't a case of that there are these these three hard categories, and I think there is a blurring into each other. And I think your your, your points are true, but mm. why is it so different? Why has this never happened before? Why hasn't there been like a random pocket? in an Italian city during the medieval period that just like started got self-referential about the Pope or, Pope or something like that. It just hasn't, it just hasn't happened. But I mean, what I would argue is, is that um, you can have like two different types of, two different types of embed, what I describe as embedded reference or implicit reference, right? So the embedded reference is the Tarantino or the sorts of videos I've been making or, you know, uh, Seinfeld, something like that where um, everything is kind of uh, built in this kind of postmodern, postmodern, endlessly intertextual world, okay? But you can also have the implicit reference, which is that you're doing this as a reaction against something else. I mean, we, we so on the Warhol streams that we did with the, the, the D&I have been doing, mm -hmm. um, the, the reason that it's been so slow is because to even understand what Warhol was doing, he had to explain what was happening um, in modern art and the abstract art and Jackson Pollock and you know all of the all of the other um, all of the other abstract you know uh, some of the guys that you guys were, were talking about earlier on, mm -hmm. and to understand that what he was doing in a sense was aware of what those guys were doing and that rather than being abstract, he was going to be rooted in 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 something that is referent in something that is uh how can i say uh real something that is recognizable something that is something that you can see mm -hmm. and you could you could look at 100 warhol pieces um and not know that but once you know that it's like okay embedded within this is something like the you know, all of art history but all works are like that you know, it doesn't matter what the, and this is what I'm saying, it doesn't matter what the genre is. Let's say, I don't know, where you talk about, um, 
talk about something like new wave or post punk as a reaction to what what came before it, which was a reaction to what came before it. Reaction became you don't even have to know that um, they don't even it, have to reference those other mm. forms to know that the the entire history of the form is buried within it. And all and all but, all but, art but, does I, that, I, surely. I, 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 but I, again, I think there's a conflation here. The the use of the medium of reference yes. and what are you referencing? And again, I would say the traditional and the modern re reference, the canon and the things that have come before it. Yeah. What while um, it's it's the susceptibility to external references and um, you know me meaningless references. I, I, I don't have a problem with this idea of saying that t to reference, um, you know, like it, where you're saying, yeah, referencing things has happened th through art, but I think it's it's like the, the traditions of that reference. Where where are they where are they drawing <clears throat> from? I typically a local localized area. Again, like Alex was pointing out, maybe they, they would go abroad. Um, but even then, it was always seen through uh, another lens. While, again, I mean, I'm not an expert on postmodernism, but um, from what I've read, it's about you know adopting other lenses as well. You know, the lens of the outsider or the the uh, lens yeah. of the. Can, the may the I say something? Uh, yeah. yeah, I also think is that it's a different of in in difference with intent. You know, there's a difference between um, echoing classical forms or echoing any other type of form and and it's your it's part of your springboard for the work that you're making and doing something that's purely designed to function at the level of in in like in crowd reference and and everything else that you've got is of little to, to no value. Mm. I mean, I think there is a quite a distinct difference in that AA, and I, I don't see these as gonna, being the you're same. Not gonna, you're not going to like what I'm going to say now, though, because in my in my view, even the artist who doesn't actually know what else is going on, right, doesn't actually bother to check what else is happening in the world, mm. without even realizing it, will be part of that conversation and will already be implicitly referencing and reacting to things without without even knowing it. I mean, my, my banner example to, to stick with the music has always been you know, <laughs> Noel Gallagher in 2010 stubbornly sticking to like mid 90s Brit, Brit pop, which was already a kind of retrograde form then, is actually something like when everybody else is doing kind of you know, uh, I, I, you know, increasingly experimental electronica, and mm. he's like stubbornly sticking to that. It doesn't even matter if Noel Gallagher knows what else is going on or not. He's making a statement within the within the within the framework of that time. He's reacting to everything else. So it's almost like the art. Like I'm saying, it doesn't even matter what the artist thinks but, or knows. He's always stuck in that kind of matrix of reference. Except that Noel Gallagher did know everything else that was going on. Well, it doesn't matter. What I'm saying, it doesn't matter. Imagine he was just an idiot. Imagine he just doesn't know. Imagine, or imagine you've got a guy who was stuck in a kind of time capsule. Well, you're and, better off uh, to compare to someone like Henry Darger or, or many other well, types of person, in which case, for Henry okay, Darger, he isn't rude, doing rude, re referencing. Rude, the I, I, don't wanna, I don't want to be rude here. <laughs> so f focusing on the individual example, okay, and the individual details on the example is not helpful in any single way. Okay, you just get past the individual. Just, just imagine the person who doesn't pay attention, but what they're producing is different from what else is going on because it's retrograde. It's just because it hasn't changed for twenty years. Mm. But by by the very fact that you're doing that, okay, you're still part of a conversation even though you don't realize it, and even if the artist dies and doesn't care about it, because sure. because the reception of that is a communal thing. I mean, I don't know. Alexander's mm. the artist. Am I talking rubbish here? Uh, no, I think that you're right. I think that you, it's the the idea of zeitgeist in that the art the artist automatically reflects something of his time, even by trying to rebel against it. He reflects something of the time that he exists in. Unless unless they're not part of that, unless they are like say they are um, um, uh, Aiden. I've forgotten his name. He's um, the chief icon painter he's a new zealander he studied and uh, he went 
he studied under the total Russian Orthodox tradition. He's not at all part of the art world in the way that you're saying. So I actually do think there's a, there is a, there is a, a very hard line that you could draw. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about, and if, if this person, if this, if this um, potential person is wanting to show work in a gallery, then you are 100% correct, AA, and it is inescapable. But if someone is not doing that and is never, not part of that tradition at all, then that doesn't apply. Do, do, just trying to understand and think about this uh, reference thing a, a little bit more, because it's not just the act of referencing, it's also the amount and the impact it has on a work. And, and I think there's a differentiation between um, like small, small details, s symbology, um, technique, which are all, I guess, kind of forms of re reference ultimately. Um, but we have to recognize that um, re reference can be used in, in my mind in, in a, a positive and on a, an organic way where it's kind of like seasoning on a food um, as opposed to what postmodernists are trying to do, which is just to to take some food, feed it to someone pump their stomach and then try and serve it up again as the original as the original meal that again you're not creating you're not going outside the boundaries of the original reference tr 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 you, you you're right that 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 um imagine there's like a guild artist he would have been taught the traditions of his father or the other guilds guild masters and even though he didn't realize it was referencing the rest of it the community of his of his nation but he was still trying to uh, again, look up like we described beforehand and, and grow and expand. While I feel like um, the postmodernist movement is almost the, the opposite, it's always folding in on itself, sort of becoming like a black hole of creativity. Okay, maybe, maybe. I mean, my, my, my question to, to you and to Alexander and to Rude is why can't the why can't it be a new language in and of itself? Um, and be, the reason I the reason I mention this and the reason I think it's important is because we actually live in a in a, an incredibly postmodern memetic moment uh, where memes, internet memes, have a lot of power, right? But internet memes are references built on references, built on references, built on references. Everybody get and that and a lot of their a lot of their kind of energy and and verve comes from the fact that it's this kind of coded language that we all get. And the are, uh, you know, it's like when when the MSN journalist tries to tries to come in and uh, understand what the evil memes of the right mean and all this sort of thing, um, and it's laughable because they, you know, one they get it wrong and two, you know, they're just they're not just not versed in the language. Um, and I think there's creative energy in that, and I don't know I don't know why it has to be this why it always has to be seen as this dead end or or, or black hole. Um, and, and Alexander, any thoughts on that before I do the super? Yeah, chat? actually, I think I think that's um, interesting. You mentioned memes because uh, I, we know that the EU hate, hates memes. It did that report on. Uh, it's called "It's Not Funny Anymore," <laughs> to, yeah. talking about the danger of far right memes for spreading hatred and so forth. Uh, and actually, this is going to be part of the next book where I talk about how vanguard art or artivism. Uh, which is a combination of activism and art, how that's used by the elites. Uh, in general, it's the progressive elites because they're the ones that are dominant. But I'm saying if you look at memes, you can see the way reactionary uh, people can create effective um, mimetic artworks in the form of memes. Um, so I think that, yes, that's, I think that's perfectly um, feasible as a route to uh, destabilizing the um, current incumbent elite. I mean, my, 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 it, it, hold, hold on, hold on a second. My, my example would be you, you held up that statue of the feminist, right? And we said it was dead, that piece. Yeah. That was probably a piece of activist art, right? I was probably yeah. got loads of funding, but it was in yeah. it. It didn't speak and it has no power at all to anybody. Oh, okay. right? it, it, it's a nerd. I, I, just scrolling through my Twitter feed, I, be, I bet you I will come across several memes from friends of ours that um, that will that will just have more power because they speak oh. they speak a truth yeah. that we all 
understand, but they're also like, I mean, I mean, okay, let's just have a look at this one. Okay, I don't know if this is a particularly good one, but we recognize like, what I'm saying is this is a living form where we recognize, I mean, no, but no, stop it, babe. I just can't go, go around anymore saying GM to everyone. Now, I don't really understand what this is, but we understand the form. Of, this this mean that we're looking at, we understand the form of the language of it, right? Um, and, and, and what I'm saying is, is that as silly as that meme was, it has more power than the bloody realist but, statue of the feminist. Uh, of course, because yeah. it's an exactly correct format for it. If you just if you try to make a sculpture right out mm. of one of those um, meme pictures, it would be dead because it's the wrong format for it. It doesn't work. Right. This is the it's it's you. I think you're comparing apples and oranges somewhat. But let me also say this. Nobody ever said it couldn't or isn't a language. Right. I think the substantive, at least from from my from my perspective, which I think is echoed by some people in the chat, you know, is that it's that the postmodern referential, heavily referential language is not as resonant, is not as substantive and is not as timeless, doesn't have any notion of the timelessness that the great classical works have. And that's the difference. That's the substantive but why, issue. But why not? Because it doesn't. The fact that you can't see it is irrelevant. It doesn't. But you see, I, my, my contention is, and I say this as somebody, you know, who has studied, I mean, it, it could be, I'll grant this, it could be that the early modern period, which I which I know pretty well, you know, I'm a subject matter, subject matter expert in that area. It oh. could be that that is a, is a particularly um, referential moment because they were, look, they were self-consciously looking at the at the classics they were self-consciously looking at greek and roman learning and they were trying to um they were trying to draw on them to build something new okay yes. but they had they also had their things they were reacting to you know medieval every man plays and you know the, the very various other old forms that weren't produced at that time uh you know vernacular forms as oh i would say um can, can, I mean, can, can we just say that the that, that, that yeah. D, D in chat has asked to be summoned? Can we please get D on? Sure. Oh, He's thrown the I, down. I, I, would just, I, would from just, the I would just say that the difference is, is we don't look at the, that, those period, the early modern period, with yeah. the eyes of someone of a contemporary thing. And we're not going in the same way. Perhaps you're right. Perhaps in 250 years, people will regard, will regard the things that I personally regard as twee, lazy, thin, and, off <coughs> and, offensively, and offensively weak as being fantastic. All the more power to them. It doesn't but, change that. What, 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 I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, though, by, by drawing on that period, if you look at, I mean, to, Pharaoh's point is there has to be something of the vernacular, there has to be something of the local culture, okay? But if you if you compare what those guys were doing to to, to you know uh, literature a hundred years before that came from Britain, um, the the they were positively cosmopolitan. They were drawing on Italian sources. They were drawing on Latin sources. They were drawing on Greek. They were drawing on French authors. It's the Western it's, canon, though. It's all Western stuff. They did. Yeah, they but it's draw, still outside, did they outside, draw outside, outside from the vernacular Iranian poetry or from. Uh, J Japanese Shinto well, I mean, you'd be you'd be surprised at the uh, at the influence of someone like uh, Avicenna, who sneaks into the Western canon through um, through Aquinas, actually, who, uh, who who constantly quotes him, or or the way or the way in which um, you know there have been whole books written on references to Middle Eastern Middle yeah, sure, Eastern sure, okay. writers. But, but, in, but, but I, I guess I guess my point is it's it's drops in the ocean. While the, the postmodernist accepts all forms equally, while the traditionalist says it's the Western canon first, and yes, we'll 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 duck and maybe sup from <laughs> far off pools, but we will drink heartily from the uh, fr from our from our own beer. I, 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 I think that, I think there are some really interesting points, but I, I think you can't escape the fact that. <laughs> Postmodernism doesn't build; it just analyzes and deconstructs. It's so, so in some ways, I, I think you've you've won me around to the referential where we we can kind of state that postmodernism is this 
uh, we, we, we call it the self-referential um, whatever, like hyper-referential uh, mode. But mm. like, you're right, all art is hyper-referential. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm converted in that regard. But um, there, there is well, some different... I, I, I just want to push back on this idea that can't build... Like, look at something in the, the aesthetic of the... Okay, these are weird examples, but if you look at the dissident right, mm. um, you know, Keith Woods, who, who's been on my shows before, um, uh, Zurius, who, who, make, who, makes, uh, who makes music, um, um, PJW has kind of lifted it and used it for his own ends, I've noticed recently, um, where you get the aesthetic of, like, the outrun. You know, it's, yeah. it's 80s yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of vaporware, yes, but yes. Re repurposed for repurposed for kind of reactionary, you know, 20, 2020, 2021 ends. Yeah. Why is that not building something new? Why Why is that kind of stuck in a dead end in your view? Okay, okay, okay. I, I think it's a good it's a good point. I, th I think that there is um, newness and growth. If I want to create that differentiation, to, to create something new is something that hasn't happened before. But it's kind of like taking a car, dismantling it, and trying to put it back together again. That car will technically be new. There will be no other car like it. But there is, n but it is no better than the car it was beforehand, and it's probably worse. It it, it is kind of like a cultural spiral and a cultural decline. Yes, you will have these new, quote unquote, quote using the quote marks here quote new things happening. Yeah. Um, but because because of the way that they are constructed out of the parts of the, the, the fully deconstructed parts of the past, um, you, you're never going to uh, transcend or create any, any anything better. Well, the past had the, these references. It did try and it, it did it did pull in this information, to other uh, other things too. But it still managed to cr to, to build better. I, 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 okay, Let, let's let's to leave literature behind a second and go back to art. Okay, let's take the Renaissance art, the Renaissance, the the, the, yeah. the high Renaissance Italian masters. Okay, you can go and see them at the Vatican and various other places in Rome and Florence and so on. When you when you look at some of those paintings, why can't you say, well, this is a car that has been pulled apart and put back together again the wheels are plato i mean in some in some cases literally you look at a thing and it's like oh here's a scene from the bible but michelangelo has put like the face of aristotle in there and you know there's a reference to someone else there and you know all of those works are constantly referencing older things why aren't yeah. they doing that what how are they building building back better as you put it <laughs> I, I almost said that. I didn't quite. I would say I didn't quite. I said building better. I've literally. I've been hanging around with you and Tony too much. Literally, I'm just getting the proper. I, proper I, 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 I would. I would say for those paintings, you would say that everything has been completely refashioned. The chassis, the bodywork, the engine, the transmission. It's been completely reworked every time. So it makes something. It makes a completely new vehicle, even though the principles may be drawn from uh, an older art form. Yeah. Okay, but you you still end up with, I mean, I, I've joked about this before. You still you do still end up with literally a hundred versions of Madonna with Child, though. I mean, yeah. so yeah. it's like, well, by the time maybe, you get to maybe, the maybe, one, maybe, the, the maybe you're right. Yeah, isn't yeah. referencing the first one. Yeah, yeah. You, you're, again, get beyond this reference thing. I'm, I agree with you. Yeah, I think yeah. a great reference. I, maybe stuff doesn't even have to be better, but it has to be at least the same. And I think that there's there's some interesting things around um, Byzantine iconic art where they purposely try and copy the master like exactly the same. But the yeah. point is that even then you've still got status. At least even then there is no decline. Um, while I think the postmodern mindset, because of the deconstruction plus analysis plus critique plus internationalism. Will have, plus will, irony. Plus irony means you're going to be making something worse and worse each time, um, and eventually have a totally defunct um, culturally com uh, company. Yeah. Pl plus, you're also integrating elements from other traditions, which kind of turn everything into a jumble. It's it's reducing language to a jumble of different sets of meanings, and so they which are not mutually compatible because they did not evolve. 
um, organically, they've been jammed together for the sake of showing that there are differences and that the author is clever enough to recognize those different references and different traditions. But it's not an articulated language because it's not because it didn't develop organically. Well, now, now, again, I, I hate because uh, I, I, people are going to hate me after this stream, but I'm just playing devil's advocate to an extent. Why could it? Why could that language that these artists, in however inept a way, are trying to forge, why can't that speak to the reality of now? Because in, if you look at the real, the lived reality of people in a place like London or a place like New York or a place like, or, or just the modern world in general, just any of us, even if you're sitting in Trumpton, you're still hooked into the internet and you see all this shit. Why can't the yoking together of disparate cultures that don't quite speak to each other be the vernacular of of now because literally that's what that's the world we live in it it it, it does indeed describe the hellscape that we live in and if you live in a hellscape the art has to be yeah. about hell right <laughs> right no it doesn't have to be at all okay. it's it's a nonsense idea that somehow art has to reflect reality really degenerate idea Okay, all right, fine. Um, shall we? Uh, shall we have a look at some? Um, shall we have a look at some super chats before we get out of here? Um, yes. Uh, if, if people uh, are I, 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 I gotta go. I gotta. I get back to work. I'm sure that whatever super chats that will abuse me, I'm sure they're 100 percent correct. So have the pleasure of accepting that you're right and I'm wrong. Go for it. She is right. She is <laughs> Second appearance of Benjamin Rude on Deepest Law. Kind of went, went about as well as his first. Um, <laughs> I think so, I went yeah. a little, quite a lot better. At least you can hear me a lot clearer this time. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Try kicking him before you insult him. I, I can't see what's going. I can't see what's going wrong. Um, yeah, it's okay. I'm, I'm off. Thanks. Bye. Um, all right. So let's let's hit these super chats before we get out of here. Um, Hugh James says, "Hello, and friends. I was in Disneyland. Paused Paris yesterday." France being France, you need a vaccine passport, but still a park-wide mask mandate. It was 30 degrees Celsius, but no float parades and other COVID BS. <coughs> That's a hellscape in itself. Yeah, standard. I, I, I swear that 50% of all of these restrictions by companies are to save money. I, I keep seeing it. I see like parts of... Um, like I, I go to a lot of kind of uh, zoos and farms and that kind of stuff with with my, with uh, Farah, my little ba baby girl, and they intentionally close stuff off, quote unquote, because of COVID. But I swear it's so they don't have to maintain as much staff, so they can still charge as much without without uh, like burning through the market. They, they do the same with the the galleries in uh, British Museum that they're closing yes. down whole galleries just because they don't want to staff them. Yeah. You see, I'm. I mean, I am so. I'm so postmodern that I even see some beauty in Disneyland. I know you guys are going to hate this, but it's like, well, Disney's got a canon. I mean, they're, yes. they're probably trying to destroy it right now, but there's something like, I think it's kind of interesting to go to Disneyland, maybe not the Paris one, but if you go to some of the older ones, how you can see the kind of generations of different waves of Disney building on top of each other. I mean, it's it's being probably wiped away now. They're probably trying to replace like mm. Snow White with Mulan or whatever. So, well, they, they, they've, they've already replaced the films, and they've got the trigger warnings. Like Lady and the Tramp had a trigger warning when I was trying to watch that the other day and stuff like that. It's literally ridiculous. Oh my oh. god! Here we go. This stream <laughs> needs a, this stream needs a trigger warning. Come on! <laughs> oh, deeply <laughs> subversive. Well, How you doing, D? You? I'm dying here. I'm literally dying. So. Oh, terrible. <laughs> I'm doing all right, actually. The respiratory thing is is uh, is mostly gone, uh, just sort of the remnants of bronchitis. But my problem now is I've, I've got, um, I believe, I injured something in my back from coughing for two weeks. So I I I, I can only sit in a very uh, specific position, or I I have uh, pain uh, in my back. So I, I'm uh, I'm I'm a bit like Stephen Hawking here. I'm. I'm and sort of all kind of propped up on my chair. I, I mean, it, I, I don't know if you caught too much of what I was saying, D, but my, my contention is that 
people make too much of these late like traditional modernist postmodernist i i just i just i mean maybe this is because i am a i'm a gen xer or whatever but i just look through history and just see people doing art always and some of it most of it's shit and some of it's really good um but the the actual like tools in the in the kit are always the seem to be the set like the specific text techniques may, may change but you still get anxiety of influence you still get re um reaction between works and you still get re uh, the referential stuff that i was talking about i don't really see like why there has to be these hard distinctions uh, i'm actually trying to come to like a almost like a kind of universalist position of just like well art is art always you know uh what do you think about that oh uh. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult question. Um, I, I don't know. I think that there, there is no escaping. Uh, you know, we are where we are, yeah, and and this idea that we can return, and that's return with a with, with a V. Um, I, I just, you know, I just think it's it's just fanciful. Uh, you know, I mean, what what can come? You know, what will come out of this essentially postmodern sort of. Uh, desert that we're in is anyone's guess but you know again i just i i, I i'm afraid i haven't uh, you know just popped on so i can hear what you gentlemen were talking about for the stream i'll have to go back and, and listen to it but um i i uh, i just feel like there's so much kind of misguided energy on uh, all sides of these these sorts of arguments and uh, you know i think it just it just ends up you just have to settle for what moves you. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. There's just never been a kind of universal canon of, of what is, quote, good and what is bad. And, and But yet people think that there has been. And so I, I just think it's trying to, uh, to sort of um, impose standards on something that never had those standards i don't know if this makes any sense or not but, but i mean so. my, my, my view is to, to come back to the to the idea of authenticity which uh farrah was talking about earlier is kind of we've been talking about to me it's it, it would the the memes that we were just looking at on twitter are far more organic or even though they're postmodern, you know inherently postmodern, they're far more authentic than if um any of us now decided to try to recreate uh you know, Michelangelo's David or something. I mean, the 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 return to tradition where you just end up just making things that are in an older style. Um, surely that is always inauthentic compared to the thing that arises organically from the moment. And the fact is, we're in twenty twenty one, so you you cannot you cannot act as if, let's say, Andy Warhol didn't exist, or you cannot act as if these. Um, these postmodern artists that you guys have been de decrying didn't happen. They did happen. You know, the mass like, migrations happen. But the <laughs> thing, but it, it, again, to me, I, I don't care about authenticity. I, I don't even know what authenticity really is. I mean, again, you, you go back to the, you know, you, you sort of take the, like the, the, what trad people like, you know, okay, this is trad art. Well, okay. Like people say, okay, I love the Georgian style of architecture in Britain. That is traditional architecture. Well, it isn't really. I mean, that is actually a foreign kind of canon of proportions and canon of styles that was brought in to Britain, uh, you know, in the, in the 17th century, maybe 16th century, depending on upon, you know, what influence you're talking about, uh, from, you know, from ideas of, of, of classicism, from Roman architecture and from, and, 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 and from, uh, you know, Palladio and, and, and people like that. So in a way, all of these things that people say are the kind of essential traditions of Britain, they aren't either, you know, they were sort of imports. I mean, if you want sort of traditional British architecture, you have to go back further than Palladio, you know, and, and, and the influence of, 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 of the Palladians. Um, you, you've got to go back to like someone like Robert Smithson, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what's more trad? I mean, a Anthony Van Dyke, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, the painter of the, the Wilton diptych, which is something that Farrah and I were talking about uh, last week or something. Um, you know, so I, I think that it, there's a lot of false questions and a lot of false assumptions that people bring up. And, and to, to me, I don't really understand authenticity. I mean, to everything in culture is 
is an inheritance in one way or the other. I mean, you are inheriting tr technical knowledge, you're inheriting stylistic knowledge, you're inheriting history, you're inheriting myths, you're inheriting religiosity. Everything is coming from your forebears. So what is yeah, authentic? I, 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 I don't, I I don't know. Same, I just, it's not an I, important question to me. I, I have exactly the same issue, uh, Dee. I mean, I, I once wrote an essay about... Um, that was published, you could probably find it, it's probably still up there somewhere. Do you remember all that stuff was going on about cultural appropriation and people were hammering like Jamie Oliver because he's not really Italian and he's making <laughs> Italian food and there was yeah, like yeah. some, like he made jerk chicken or something and there was an outrage because he was a culturally appropriating Jamaican food. And I, I basically just made a simple point, like well, people have got some really odd ideas about what is authentic, you know. You can deconstruct a you can deconstruct a curry. You can say, well, you know, the vinegar came from Portugal, and the you know, all every single element of this thing was not was once not indigenous to the to the thing itself. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and you could do it with anything. Like, yeah, it, I mean, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's certainly cuisine. It's a completely ridiculous idea. I mean, Jamie Oliver deserves all the pain that can be inflicted upon him, but for <laughs> different reasons, you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's just stupid. I mean, all cuisine. Just like so much art, just like so much architecture. I mean, it is an accumulation of influences and and uh, and strains from so many different places, and so many different. There's people. there's no getting around this. I mean, like I was trying to say, like if you look at Shakespeare and his contemporaries, almost every element of the of, of those plays is, is 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 borrowed from somewhere else, and often from often from foreign foreign or Italian sources. But people might say, okay, yeah, let's go more track, let's go Chaucer, say. Right, but yeah. then there would be people who'd be like, "Hold on, he he has a lot of French influences there. He was part of like Richard the Second's Pansy Court, you know. Uh, so many elements in Chaucer are kind of quote unquote non-indigenous. So, so so now so now you've got to a point where the place where most people would even start the the canon, what's the, 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 the canon the, is already the Western, authentic. The Western canon." And, and again, like again, D, D is correct. Yeah. The the cl classism is a for, is a quote unquote foreign form, but it's still still Western. You know, we were in we were part of the the Roman uh, Empire, and it's, it, it's, it's left that marks yeah, on it. Yeah, but it's not entirely Western though. I mean, to, you know, what what part of it? Okay, well, go to I mean, go to the Brighton Pavilion. I mean, is that what is that Western? Mm, no, but, yes, but again, but, again, no, but this, is, this is what I'm saying about you. You 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 you're right. All all art is a is a network of references, but my my uh, proposal is that traditional art, the majority of those networks are based in in the locality or at least in um, like a uh, the western the western the western region, and we've entered a time where um, all cultures are held up as equally good and equally vir virtuous, and more so than that that non-Western cultures are greater than the West. And yeah, well, that's, how, that's how, how, how can, of course. But how, how can you say that? But I, I think the, the problem is, is that um, you're going you're, you're to you're end up destroying yourself by doing that. And so, so that's where I think you, you, we can't say that where you draw your references from is is equal. A reference from across here is the same as a reference from across there. Or, or again, um, you know... The, the percentages and, I, and again i think that's yeah may, maybe that's the the thing is we've um just become totally international and totally c c cut off from um you know who we so are you, want, you want an eu of traditionalism pharaoh rather than uh rather than <laughs> exactly. homo yeah. <laughs> i mean you know that's I'm, I'm saying, I mean, yes. go, hey, 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 sorry alex Sorry, AA is getting dangerously close to Nish Kumar ter territory and doing a BBC <laughs> video on how everything you love about Britain isn't really British. <laughs> everything you love about Britain. Well, I mean, in, in, but in a way, it's true. I mean, you know, uh, but but it's true about everywhere. I yeah. mean, almost everywhere, unless you went to the most sort of primitive example of Neolithic carving. And even then, that's probably some sort of an import, you know. I mean, so yes, you have to apply those standards equally. And uh, of course, that's one of the things that we all hate. I mean, I don't think anyone is is sort of, well, um, no, I'm not going to say that. Of course, there's people protesting because there's, you know, the world is full of idiots. But, you know, there, there aren't that many people who, who get exorcised about seeing kind of Japanese influences in, in uh, 
you know, in, in post-impressionism, like, you know, Vincent van Gogh or, or mm. Gauguin or any of those artists kind of taking from traditions of Japanese graphic arts. I mean, but, you know, I think the, 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 the complaint comes when someone either says, well, that's appropriation, you can't do that, or these are, they're drawing from tradition which is better than, you know, than what they came from and, and, and you know, they're sort of stealing or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the influence doesn't bother me. I, I don't care about the indigenous nature of my art. I mean, I, I just like I don't care about its authenticity. I care about, you know, oh, I care oh, about oh, beauty. Oh, I, I care about something that makes me think. I care about something that moves me. And that can be from anywhere, you know, and, and call, call me a, you know, call me a, a race traitor. But, but that's but, just uh, how it is. Just, just out, out, outside of there, I think this, it poses an interesting question with that same mentality, not just from an artistic perspective, but from a culturally, because cultural perspective, how can you have a tribe? How can you have a group of people that are connected together and share values if everyone is saying, it doesn't, it doesn't matter internationally where I'm drawing my references from. This is why we have a, you know, the, this, the, the rapid dissolution of all nations that is happening because everyone's referencing from all over the world. Everyone says that everything is, is equal. And yeah, so, but that's been happening for thousands of years, Pharaoh. I mean, that isn't a new thing. I mean, that started as soon as there was contact with, you know, with from the east to the west. I mean, in fact, many of the things that, you know, I, I don't want to go all Nish Kumar, but like, you know, <laughs> one of the things that we were talking about at one point was ultramarine, the blue, the traditional blue made from lapis lazuli. Uh, that was not possible without trade from Afghanistan uh, through Venice you know, that colour wouldn't have reached Europe. And before that, you would have had to rely on, you know, sort of dye-based colours like indigo from woad or something like that, which are not permanent, you know, not particularly light, fast, permanent colours. You know, you can't use them, you know, in, in most types of, of, of kind of permanent painting. So, I mean, even but, something okay, as okay. fundamental, even <laughs> something as fundamental as the blue of the Virgin's robe in medieval painting wouldn't have been possible without these contacts between East and West, yeah, I, 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 again, but it's about the, it's about the percentages and having that core to, core, to, core to you. So, for example, if I just put it in a, in a terrible analogy, imagine a family eats uh, supper together every day of the week, and they have a traditional English meal each day of the week, apart from on Friday where they have a curry. That's that's the that is the tradition where you've got the core food is traditional food or food that has been made from tradition yes if you can deconstruct it further in time it's from other sources but at that point yeah, in no, time I mean, most, of it, most of it's french so <laughs> but, but at that point in time it, it is british now compare that to a family that has a, a, a meal from a different country every single day of the week a ta taco tuesday um monday it's peruvian food you know, they have no they it's have no I'm joking, I'm joking, <laughs> the, the, like and then imagine a society of those people. Like, yeah. how is that a nation? How are those people connected together? They 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 ultimately are totally individualistic and um, fractured from each other. I don't know. I think it's false distinctions all the way down. And I mean, I see what you're saying, and I understand. But I think we have to find our our uh, sort of unity as peoples or tribes or nations or whatever somewhere else you know maybe it has to be race i don't know <laughs> but you know i, I just i don't <laughs> think i don't think you can draw it along these lines i, I mean i just think it, be, it becomes ridiculous correct me if i'm wrong though i mean we we started this by uh you know d in the in the chat you mentioned before people have this notion of the traditional it's always 19th century art right it's always like it's always yes. this moment in the 19th century it, it, ten, but... it tends to be yes yeah but i mean my understanding of the victorians you know, for all of their virtues or whatever, they were obsessed with the order. They were Orientalists. Like they, they, they it was, uh, what's his name? Edward Fitzgibbon who translated the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. And they were, they were constantly trying to show off their, like uh, exotic, you know, the exotic knowledge of Egypt. And, you know, they yeah. were doing their archeological digs. You, 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 you know. right. And, and who were the Britons that allowed the Catholics to have positions of power? The Victorians. <laughs> That's all I'm yes. saying. Oh, so, I'm afraid and, and the others, Catholics had others. a position of power well before the Victorians, <laughs> Pharaoh. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, I, mean, I also you have to commend I mean. you. Uh, you can't pronounce anything, AA, but you said Omar Khayyam beautifully. beautifully so. Well, you know, 
Some I would expect. I would expect. Rabbits don't die. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, all right, shall we hit these super chats to get out of here? So sorry. Yeah, I, 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 have to, I, have to, I have to go unfortunately and uh, put my child to bed. But um, thank you very much, oh. everyone. Cheers, Bye, Pharaoh. Pharaoh. See you soon. Bye, Pharaoh. Oh well. Sorry, Alexander. This is a stream is kind of. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry for, for jumping <laughs> on, but you know. No, no, it's it's, it's a pleasure yeah. to be uh, um playing with the A team. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so even that was a beautiful 1980s reference. I oh, love it when a plan comes uh, together. You know. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> well, you've got Hassan, Scott. Hassan uh, Shahin says, "Yeah, uh, I, I I haven't had a cigar since the event." Yeah, I've I haven't been, had a cigar been dying for like I... three weeks. Like, yeah, I've been so, so ill. No, I haven't had a cigar and I haven't had a drink um, in like three weeks. Hassan wow. Shahin says, UK architect here, the current cultural narrative is that art is the just self-expression and that it shouldn't require a purpose. How do we divorce our views on art from the boomer truth regime? Yes, mm. that's a very good point, that it's seen as an individual expression and that you can't be taught anything. It comes from inside and, uh, you know, art is what you what you make of it and so forth. And that um, but, there is nothing beyond unmediated expression. That's very you see, correct. I mean, again, people are going to start calling me like a, literally a cultural Marxist or something in a moment. But in, in my view, the post the, the, this endless textuality I've been talking about, that the the postmodernity, the the endless play of references, uh, which is which is rooted in various different traditions, um, in a way is 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 a constant reminder to both the artist and the audience that you're dealing with something that is bigger than just yourself, and that and that and that true art almost kind of transcends the individual and and comes to um capture something something that's in the ether something that's out there whatever it happens to be that is um that is bigger than the than the mere notion of uh you know self-expression and i would suggest all the better best art does that yeah but, but would, would you say that that perhaps um has replaced a, a quality of transcendence where there's no longer a reference to god or morality yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think it's a harmful idea, the art as self-expression. But yeah. but what I'm what I'm saying is, if if um you uh, skip from the notion of the individual genius, which I would say is actually more of a modernist notion than a postmodernist notion, um, mm -hmm. if you if you skip if you skip uh, from that to this idea that you are const you you are always, um inescapably linked to the matrix of previous art um other artists you're always you always have this context then you 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 can't just say this is my self-expression disconnected from anything else because it's a nonsense idea already does that make any sense no yeah yeah, yeah, yes. yeah that makes sense i, I do think that the, the idea of, of art as self-expression is one of the most corrosive things, uh, and as you, I, 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 you know, I think it's important to, to understand. People, people say, people throw the words postmodernism around with, without really understanding what that means. Certainly, from an art historical perspective, but I, I would think that most postmodernists would probably agree with that, as would most pre-modernists. You know, I, I do think that a lot of this idea, even though some of the art that I, you know, some 20th century art that I love the best and 19th century art is from expressionist movements, but I think that it opened Pandora's jar, you know, to, to a lot of terrible things and a lot of mush came out of that. And uh, I, I do think it, it is one of the most sort of damaging ideas that that, that is the be all and end all. Of, of art no i mean absolutely mm. not and I, I i do think it's it's interesting that you could probably link kind of pre-modern and post-modern just with that idea uh, yeah. yeah no i mean it, i guess the different the danger is with it is um is that uh, if you take if you take what i was saying to the ultimate ends it dissolves it dissolves the individual into the into the community and um, it really is the head of uh, what people might call collectivism, right? Mm, but yeah. there's the there's the community there's the communitarian collectivism of the right, and then there's the evil socialist <laughs> collectivism yeah. of the left, right? Um, and uh, that's one of the, see. I'm interested in these things. 
I think that's one of the reasons why you get um, you get you get a kind of postmodern right, believe it or not, who are like the likes of Keith Woods and stuff, because something about that is talking to them, because it's inherently social, right? It's 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 inextricably linked to everybody else, so you can't just have the one person, and then it appeals to hardcore Marxists, <laughs> um, and and actually it's the quote unquote classical liberals who are caught who are caught really clutching to their John Lennon LP. <laughs> well, we are in this time of strange bedfellows, I would say. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I, Cringe Walker says, I'm told this shift uh, was primarily from the camera because once you could do a photo, art needed a new goal other than photorealism. This is a point that comes up a lot. Uh, Alexander Adams, is it true? Uh, yes and no. Uh it's true that there was some particular painter, I think it's Della Roche, who said, seeing the first photograph, ah, painting is, uh, painting is now dead. But uh, the early painters and many painters since then have used photography as a basis for what they do, as a reference. Um, and, you know, even when it comes to someone like Gerhard Richter, who Rude mentioned, uh, he bases his art on uh, photographs, some of them. Um, uh, yes and no. So obviously... There was this hyper accelerated the drive towards individuation of different schools in modernism because people were no longer having to do the 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 the, the dog you know the the legwork of recording stuff because there was no other way of recording stuff. So you wouldn't be making portraits anymore because you could get a photograph done. And it became more a, a por painted portrait became more of a status thing. Um, but yes, it did tend to accelerate the hyper individualization and the proliferation of modernist schools. I think that's <clears throat> absolutely correct. Uh, it's certainly my view, M much more elegantly stated than I would have put it. But oh, uh, I, I also think other things change. You know, I think people point to photography, but there's, there are other things that change in the 19th century that also had profound changes on art. Uh, one thing I, I, I would like to talk about in some future stream is, is the way that chemistry uh, and and manufacturing changed literally the entire palette of of Western and Eastern art of f forever. I mean, you know, uh, my my thesis, not my thesis, I, I've, I think it's been provided by other people, uh, is that Impressionism was was partially response to this entire new palette of, of colors that was available to artists, which had not been available before. You know, mm -hmm. there was no purple paint before so the 19th century. There was there... no bright orange paint before the 19th century. There was one stable red, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, you had a very limited palette and suddenly in the 19th century, you had this literal rainbow. Uh, and so, of course, that's going to have fundamental changes and... in the way art is made. Yes, and it was provided in mixed, pre-mixed in tubes, which made it portable. Yes, yes. You, 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 you didn't, I mean... The, the, there was a huge rise in, in colourmen, many of them British, mm. you know, uh, Reeves and, and Rowney and Winsor Newton, and uh, you know, in the 19th century. Uh, that, uh, yeah, and all of these things certainly changed, changed the face of art. It wasn't just uh, photography, although, as, as Mr. Adams said, that, that, that had profound impact on certain areas of art, uh, like portraiture. <laughs> Does that does that mean then, if I'm understanding you guys correctly, that uh, the Marxists are basically right that the, the you know the, the superstructure that the economic base comes first and the superstructure follows? Well, this, yes, but I mean you, you could say the whole boom of the the Dutch the Dutch uh, genre boom came from um, the outlawing of well, the division between the church and the state. So you had the Cath the Catholics being basically cut out, and that ended um, a lot of religious painting in. Um, the Netherlands in the 17th century, and you saw the rise of genre painting because there was a boom in the middle class because of um, overseas trading, which provided a lot of money for wealthy burghers to commission uh, landscapes and portraits and still lives. But they weren't commissioning biblical paintings because there was this sort of ordinance against um, uh, religious imagery because it was a strongly Protestant country. And that all came from the economic situation. So the Marxists are correct in some degrees, even though I'm not a Marxist. Mm. Very interesting. Okay, because um, this—I mean, this is basically what the, you'd call a materialist analysis of the, yeah, of the of the history of art in a way. Um, okay, um, let me just uh, c carry on. 
Um, the, the, only reason I, the only reason I mention that is because I think on the right in general, um, there's a there's a notion. So on the left, if you're a true true Marxist, history is driven purely by these non impersonal material processes. Whereas on the right, um, we tend to prefer to believe that people are animated by ideas, and that ideas are really the things that make the impact, rather than simply the um, the kind of impersonal uh, material processes. You know, um, and I don't know. I I don't know. Like I I I understand both arguments, um, and you can. You can kind of make them both work in various different ways, uh, but this is a this is a case where it really does seem like technology certainly uh, has a massive role on the sorts of things that are possible. You know, even even outside of art, you know, just the Gutenberg press and the Reformation, or whatever else uh, you can think of, um, or you know, the internet and the bloody uh, Arab Spring. <laughs> And you know, before we all believe, before we all find out they were astroturfed. Um, but you, you understand what I'm saying, right? There's um, technology has an impact of what is possible to do, let alone yeah. what to think. Um, so I, I don't know which way round the. Maybe it's a dialectic, as a, they like to say. Um, anyway, um, Cringe Walker says, uh, uh, Bell Phosphorus Knight says, uh, this is something I appreciate from the East. Art is only a reflection of the self. The gestures, form, anatomy, facial expressions. It derives itself from the organic self. It's not styles and strokes. Uh, any thoughts on that? <coughs> um, I don't feel qualified to expound on that. I don't even understand it. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, no comment. I mean, again, the East is quite big as well, you know. Um, yeah. Do you, do you know? I, I think it might be fun for one stream to get Panama hat on and to read some bloody um, uh, Persian poetry because it's very like, um, how can I say? It's very ab not abstract, but kind of like it's very upward looking in a way yeah. that uh, in a way that is almost you wouldn't even know you're in Persia most of the time. So mm. I, 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 I have some wonderful translations of Rumi. Uh. It's Rumi, yeah, you could do some Rumi, some Hoffers, and I personally, to me, my um, uh, my grandfather, who's a very strange chap in many ways, we everybody would be sitting around like uh, you know pottering about, and he, then he suddenly just start reciting Hoffers from the corner of the room, and everybody would turn around and be like, and then he just recite you know ten ten lines of Hoffers, and everybody would listen, and then they'd go back to doing what they were doing. It's a very strange, I mean, kind of surreal, you know. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I've always encouraged that. I think everyone should memorize at least one good long poem. It, it's a wonderful thing to have that at your command. And, and you know, yeah. J Journeyman says, um, most hip hop. Well, I actually think that we in this country could learn a lot from um, Iranian culture in terms of inculcating a living literary culture and tradition whereby you know they can all name their seven poets and the, their statues are everywhere and you know it, it's like part of the fabric of the place and um i feel like beyond uh, beyond like knowing who shakespeare is people have a real paucity of of uh knowledge of our great poets but, but that's but that's but that's absolutely deliberate yeah. Because it's modern, it's modern educators, and they do not, they would not agree on who the six or seven poets were, and yeah. there, there would be uproar if at least not two or three of them were women, and so forth. There's no yeah, way. I, that that I, I was made to study deliberate. this horrific book called Six Women Poets. Ugh. Oh God, it was just, it was just, uh, yeah. But I mean, there are some, there are some good uh, people. <laughs> fascists in my audience would be interested to read some Ted Hughes poetry. I'll tell you that much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. love that it was a hawk rising. The entirety yeah. of the earth was was made for my claw. You know, it's kind of uh, a yeah. anyway. or, or we could read Ted Hughes's wife. Uh, uh, she has a poem we, called we could do Daddy. A which, 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 <laughs> got, she has a poem called Daddy, which is oh, very yes, uh, yes. fashion <laughs> fashion adjacent. <laughs> yes. Even Daddy, has the word yeah. even has the word lampshade in it. <laughs> Jenny Munn says um, most hip hop fans have high time preference and therefore would never discover 
the melodic majesty of Lisa Stansfield. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you, you... What am I doing here? <laughs> I ask I, myself the same question every time I'm on. God. I think you have to give more respect to Riza than people like this. They, you know, Jay Diller and these sorts of characters. Their tastes are often a lot more eclectic than you imagined. Um, Anthony uh, Zufarin says, all art, because, because beyond just being black men from the ghetto, they're artists. This is why, I'm, this is why I've been trying to, maybe I've got an impossibly universalist kind of naive view of this, but I think it's possible for anyone from any background to tap into what I'm talking about and to, and to get there through any form, which is, um, you know, an unpopular view, I know. Uh, it's Anthony, possible. It's po it's possible, but I do think that certain cultures have a fog that is much that, that it makes it much more difficult for for any genius that arises in them to to wade through it to find the truth. You know, so, some forms are better than others. Some forms. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm, are I'm better afraid than no matter how much you try to convince me, the rap <laughs> form really does nothing for me. You know, personal personal taste. All right, we'll carry on. Uh, Antony Zufarin says, all art is political. Film, anonymous. Thoughts? Um, yes. Uh, read my forthcoming book next year. Nice. Um, but the, per the personal is not the political, though. But <laughs> be careful, <laughs> because that, that, that always comes up next, and it's one of the most disgusting, mm, yes. uh, disgusting phrases. Uh, God, I remember... I, mean, I remember... You know, someone who should have known far better uh, actually said that to me with a straight face <laughs> when I was young. Queen <laughs> oh. uh, Walker says, Ray finished transitioning, I see. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's because he was saying, let me finish. Queen um, Walker says, but this is all great, honestly. Queen uh, Walker says, uh, um, Darmok and Jaled at... Tangara. What's that then? Does anyone know? Uh, would it be a reference to Indian art, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in my experience, in um, in you know, they talk about like decolonizing the canon and all this sort of thing. They don't. They don't put the genuine Eastern canon on the like. It's not like they're suddenly doing Rumi. Um, or like Japanese poets, you know, traditional Japanese poets. What it means is there's a course with Brick Lane on it. That's what it means nine, nine times out of ten. I don't know about, uh, I don't know how that works in the art world, but I find it incredibly disingenuous. It, it's, it's often just a way, it's a form of affirmative action for current Asian and black writers who, who they want to push, basically. Yeah, and de decolonialization is essentially anti-Westernism. And subaltern theory is basically designed, it was back, it was subaltern theory was backward engineered to allow Indian Marxists to dunk on the West. Yeah, you, you get actually Spivak and all these characters. You know, I was made yeah. to read that shite. Um, but what I'm, what I'm saying is when all is said and done, if you like, at least Edward Said was like, yes, get acquainted with the great works of uh, the Middle East and the great works of China and Japan. Um, but they don't do it. They don't know fucking yeah, anything. There, there are there are fantastic canons and they are worth learning. And there were and you had, I mean, we're going to be doing our stream on um, Orientalism, and you had some fantastic Orientalists who were Western and they were absolutely devoted to properly understanding hieroglyphics and Arab culture and so forth. And they they were not necessarily, you know, wishing to impose their own mindset. And they were absolutely devoted to it. And there are fantastic traditions um, that exist separately from the West and they are very well worth learning. Um, but you know, they are a different they're a different tradition. They're a different strand. Yeah. Um I, I, my my point is that is that the the, the so-called post-colonialists and so on, they, they don't actually put that as reading. Yeah. It's, it's always just, you know, something like, uh, I mentioned Brick Lane because uh, I don't know if it, Monica Ali took over my office while I was on sabbatical once. And um, I I had to pop in to get a book and I, I bought a sandwich and I was just popping into my office and she was there. 
And she looked up and looked at me and I looked at her. And then I was like, okay, I'll come back later. It was it was a weirdly hostile kind of exchange, like kind of because I I just have no like what what was she doing? Maybe you'd interrupted something. I don't know what she was doing. Like she was just not expecting me because I I've obviously had the key and she, I would uh, I wasn't. So she lo- so locked the door and you unlocked it and walked in. I see. <laughs> well, I didn't. You know, she wasn't. It was a strange. It was a very awkward moment. But uh, but yes. What a Karali. Uh, Red Hammerhead says, um, I'm not against uh, modern art. I'm against poop art. And in less than uh, 100 years, we went from this modern art to poop. Not a great trajectory. Mm, I, I, w- I would say I think it's possible to like traditional art and modern art. Um, and I think the important thing is to distinguish between good forms and good artists and bad forms and bad artists in those particular areas. Uh, uh, Belfast Knight says AA does have a point. Memes are a new thing. Yeah, but my point is not that new memes are a new thing. My point is that there's always been this. There's always been this, um, and that out of that, genuine creativity can blossom, and something new is born with a fusion of the old things. Um, so I, I see no real difference between uh, a Shakespeare play and the, the you know, and the and stuff that was produced yesterday using a quote-unquote postmodern form. But that's because I I don't, I mean, I think you could make an argument that Shakespeare is postmodern uh, and that all artists are quote-unquote postmodern. I, I just don't, I don't make a... Eclectic, I don't make, not postmodern. Yes, I, exactly. And well-read, not postmodern. E- e- eclectic. Yeah, but what, what, else is, what else is it apart from, apart from this process of, you know, I mean, if anything... Um, so you know, some postmodernists show off a bit too much in terms of their wanting yeah. to show their lear- learning on their sleeve or whatever. Um, but what, like, what? Why is Tarantino not e- eclectic in the same way? I don't really get it. I don't really get the distinction. But anyway, we're going long. JS says, "I dare the panel to defend Duchamp's urinal." D has already done it on our previous stream on Modern Art. Yeah, we talked about the urinal and, and Duchamp as well. You, you would you would be lucky if all the sh- if all the your most hated artists were uh, a- a- as intelligent and sensitive as Duchamp was. I, I will just say that you can think whatever you like about Duchamp and his work. Although there's a lot of it, and, and I, I would urge people if they only know the urinal to look into some of the other work. I mean, some of the paint the the early paintings uh, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, given things I've seen coming up uh, at the moment, you would be lucky if, if all bad artists were Duchamp quality. That's all I would say. I'm going to piss everyone off and even push it further. Hi, what about J.R.R. Tolkien, a man who spent his entire life studying, uh, you know, d- d- uh, medieval uh, languages and forms, Middle English? Um, and then bringing all of that wealth of learning and wealth of um, uh, knowledge into into something like Lord of the Rings, he creates a brand new world. But the materials of that world are things that he's borrowed from elsewhere. I, I just don't know. Isn't all creation borrowed clothes? In in some, there's nothing new. I don't get it. I don't get the. I don't get how people are making this distinction between. Um, uh, the stuff that was made like last week and stuff that was made a hundred years ago or two thousand. I, I don't think ago. I don't think anyone on this stream has has argued from sort of art coming ex nihilo, you know, like out of nowhere. I don't think any, or that you know the individual genius stands apart from society. Um, I don't think anyone said that. Okay, yeah, uh, but Belfast might uh, says, "What if memetics and referential art are not the art of the elites, but for the low masses, no higher vision." Kind of like how AA refers to dialectic English as improper language to cosmo to cosmopolitan. Uh, sorry, he means uh, you know di- different regional dialects of English as improper language to the cosmopolitan elites. Um, well, how can you see the thing is how can the referential art be the be the be the art for the for the low masses? I mean, it's something like Ezra Pound's Canto is never going to be the art for the. For the no, for the but, mess, but every single word of that is a reference to something was taken from somewhere, or you know, am I wrong? 
No. Um, no. So, 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 I mean, I, I think the, I think the references inherently play to. You see, this is why I'm interested now. In I'm, I'm also interested in the interplay between the people who receive the thing and don't get the references. This is why I'm, I'm mm -hmm. interested in the Zoomers as a, as a kind of phenomena. They don't fucking know anything, and yet everything they do is a reference. They, these people are swimming completely blind. You know, they, you know, they'll send me references. They're like, oh. That that film you showed, or that clip there, or that—that's some meme I saw. You know, so I, yeah, I find but, it I find it remarkable how little they but, know. But yeah. but that's that's why so much postmodernist art doesn't work. It's because you need to get the reference in order for you to get anything at all from the work. And of course, that's not always the case. And it becomes spot the reference, and it's becomes self congratulation. It becomes too self referential. Um, yeah, and too much of that. a quotation game. And but so I, that's why I, I, a lot I, of it works. Uh, fails to work. Oh, sorry, uh, Alexander. Um, I, I think that that problem exists in other areas, other you know, besides postmodern art as well, or modernism, or, what, or, or whatever. I mean, try reading Alexander Pope if you don't understand classic the classics. You know, try try reading some, try reading the Rape of the Lock. You know, if you don't understand classical references, or even Milton. I mean, you know, it's very very difficult. Uh, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's works are filled with esoteric references that you would only get if you had the, the sort of education that those men had. Yeah. And there uh, are levels so there are levels of understanding with these things. And there are, this, there are this, levels of understanding. And some, but I, some things, I think, you know, the level is so high, <laughs> like Ezra Pine, for instance, yeah. as wonderful as, 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 as he is. Uh, but it's, it's right. I mean, what, what I'm saying is it is possible for something to work on two levels. I mean, I, I'll come back to the Tarantino film. Many people could just watch those and be like, oh, that was a fun action film or whatever. They wouldn't, you know, they could completely ignore all of the, the clever, meta textual stuff that's going on. And I'm sure like 99% of the viewers of those films did that. And they worked fine as films, you know, as, um, but it's there for the people who, it's there for kind of an elite to yeah. pick up on. Very, it, I guess. very good art is going to do that. It's going to be yeah. multivalent, you know. Yeah, and and that's that's what I've said. You've got you've got to distinguish the good from the bad within the different schools and within the different areas. I don't think you can de condemn a whole area. I would s tend to spend less time on postmodernist art, just because I think that the mo a greater proportion of it is not terribly good or not terribly nourishing. Yes, um, ninety nine Iron Deke says. Western art was basically okay until World War One. It became worse and worse and worse, just like everything else post World War One. Um, question. Uh, depends what your taste is. No, I don't. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, again, I don't know what what is worse. What is better? I mean, what are these terms? You know, how are we using these terms? I, I don't know. I don't even know how to answer these questions. I, it's just like you know. It's that old thing. Is this painting good or bad? Well, I don't know. I mean, what on what on what level? What context? You know, what aspect uh, are you asking? What 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 what's the nature of good and bad in your estimation? You know, See, I, I mean, I, is it I colourful? Think, I, can, I, always, okay, I can answer that. But is it good? Is it bad? Is it is it better? Is it worse? I don't know. You see, see again, everybody's going to roll their eyes, but I think you have to come at whatever it is from within its own little special special canon you know its own little this is why i say you'll never understand you know whether it's whether it's rap or death metal or any other genre you'll never understand it from the outside you have to understand it from the inside and only then can you make a judgment on whether it's good or bad within its within its own terms um and uh, for, for most people they'll just never be into art uh, or whatever it happens or whatever form it happens to be, they'll never be, be have the time or the inclination to be into it enough to be able to have uh, what I would describe as a that, discernment sound, and taste within the, within that, the thing itself. That sounds like a bit like you're, you're stepping away from judgment. It's like saying, oh, you know, I don't think you can judge Satanism until you've actually practiced Satanism. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I guess so, but... Um, I'm talking about art rather than uh, okay, yeah, rather than a religion. You know, I think I'm exaggerating uh, for comic effect. But but yeah, but but effectively, yes, that would be a weakness of my. That would be a weakness <laughs> of my. Um, I mean, I, I've I've mentioned before, D. You do end up with the the absurd scene in uh, Salo where you have the uh, the the libertines literally uh, 
you know, tasting little bits of shit and kind of categorizing and ranking them. Yeah. Um, so you do have to be aware of that. Um, I mean, there's I an example of, I, I think, a very powerful work of art that is morally and, you know, viscerally repugnant, you know, on almost every level. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I, there's all these difficult areas. People just want to simplify everything so much. But I think, like, every human endeavour, it just, you know, it's wading into a, to a wonderful swamp of, 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 you know, and whether you sink or swim just depends upon whether you accept that you're never going to sort it out all out, you know. I mean, you, you, but, you just, you have to sort of, you know, create your own way through uh, my, in my, a way. 99 Iron Duke says, yeah, yeah um, I do, I do take Alexander's point though, and it's something I've always been aware of in myself, which is that if you become so eclectic that you, that you come to appreciate all styles, in the end, do you come up, do you come up against just an absence of actual taste? Because you've learned to love everything, you know. You've turned into global homo. Yeah. So there is a there is a kind of because because you know what's the difference between that and like um, having like I'm sure there are massive channels here on YouTube that spend uh, hours you know analyzing Marvel movies to within an inch of their life. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I I remember a little bit of this from the Star Wars from my days as a Star Wars fan, right? Um, and there are kind of two different frames within the Star Wars world. You can be like, um, or three really, you can be a Star Wars fan, right? Who is a Star Wars fan up until a certain point. Uh, I'm a Star Wars fan up until the end of the, the up until the end of the, the first three movies and nothing else after that is real. Uh, I'm a fan up until the end of the prequels, but then the new ones I don't take. Uh, I like everything up until The Last Jedi. You know, you get, you get that kind of thing. Um, then you get the Star Wars fan who just loves everything, has to love everything within the Star Wars universe, and their their real thing is like getting deep into the lore and stuff like that. And then you get the, the third type who comes there as a film fan and wants to kind of take apart, you know, um, like the Mister Plinkett or the or the Mauler, you know, these these sorts of uh, these sorts of characters. And um, I always found, you know, and people are going to again have a go at me here. I always found that you get more enjoyment and you get more out of it if you take the second position, even though it's the even though it's the bugman position. You'll get more out of what you're looking at if you're not coming to destroy the thing, you know. Um, mm. But uh, but 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 again, uh, you know. Uh, well, that requires a certain openness, and I, I I think you know we're in a community where you know the trait of openness is is not particularly high, you know. Whether you're autists or right wingers, I mean, both groups don't aren't known for indexing in, in in that sort of thing. So, you know, it is going to be a problem. But I, I think you know, if you are really, I mean, there are people who are not going to ever be sensitive to art. You know, they're going to like, you know, I, I don't know, some genre picture that they saw in reproduction, and you know, whatever, and that's fine. But you know, don't pretend that your judgment should have any weight you know you're perfectly allowed to have your own personal taste but you know some people have uh, you know more claim to be to be listened to when expounding upon that taste you know <laughs> i mean this is people you know i i, I get i'm sometimes I, I sometimes am forced to be a bit contentious and say that you know art, art you know these questions aren't for plebs but that's really what i mean you know i mean it, it just depends upon how how much you're willing to engage with whatever it is, whether it's you know, you know, nineteenth century you know Orientalist type art or you know, mod you know early modernism or whatever you know, uh, and there are just some people who don't care at all. They don't have any kind of openness to anything at all, and that's that's absolutely fine. But don't pretend that your uh, your input is is important. But there is a. Uh, I, I guess one of the, li the limits um, that the, I guess the, the eclectic Gen, Gen X approach comes up against is like, well, I really like T. S. Eliot. I really like uh, G. K. Chesterton. Um, I really like the modernists, but I, I like the kind of Catholic revivalists. Oh, they hated each other. I have to pick a side now, and I'm always on the same. Like, well, we'll learn something from all of them. We don't have to pick a side. Yeah, yeah. Why do you have uh, to pick a side? I mean, you know, it's just like mm -hmm. people just assume. Okay, well, I. 
okay, I'm doing these streams about Andy Warhol, so I must, you know, I must not like so and so and so and so. I mean, preposterous. Yeah, I'm I'm looking over here at this at this table, and and I've got I've got two medieval wood carvings on it, and I have a metal statue of Mister Peanut, you know, and. All those things give me pleasure looking at them, but you know, yeah, I don't have to choose. Uh, and yes, I mean, again, there's obviously going to be a danger in, in, in eclecticism taken too far. But you know, why why not? If you're given this wonderful smorgasbord of beautiful and tasty things, why why not sup on it? We're so decadent, D. That's what they say. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a Protestant, so I, I don't have any problem with being a, a lux, being luxuriant. Ninety nine nine Deke said Britain created modern India far far more than India had much to do with Britain. Um. Yep. I go along with that. Uh, misanthropic humanist says, art is self expression purely and simply is incomplete. But art is self-expression based in the context of history and culture done correctly. Never talk art without D again, you Philistines. <laughs> I mean, I think Pharaoh and uh, Alexander Adams... No, I think they... Uh, no, I, I think don't they know if I have much... to react to the end of that. I think, I, they did much... that. I think they did much better without me. Uh. <laughs> Mark Antonio Almost says... Almost have a face reveal there. <laughs> no, no, I, the, the camera is disabled, so... Ma Mark yeah, Antonio says, real. great stream. I think AA is right. Uh, t referencing is inevitable. Seems to come down to how big and recognizable the chunks are. Um, one was once required to internalize the work referenced. Now you can just chop it up and drop it in. Yeah, that's true as well. That mm. is true. It's become a lot easier to just pick, you know. And, and um, sources are much easier to find because, of course, you can find people explaining it and their and their links on the internet, and you can find the originals. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you it, know, yeah. I, I remember I, I having I, having to go to the library uh, and find pictures of things that I needed a reference, and and then make terrible, uh, you know, photocopies of them. <laughs> you know, and haul them back to my studio. I mean, it wasn't that long ago in the scheme of things. So yes, I mean, obviously now you ha can have high resolution images of everything that you want right at your fingertips, uh, and you don't have to do any of the legwork to get there. But well, for us, Knight says, yeah. I mean, but in a way, that makes me think. Well, in a, in a world with the internet, maybe maybe the, maybe the most authentic form is hypertextual. But then again, well, I don't get back into all of that. But I, it's like what's authentic to the moment, you know? Maybe what was authentic in 1381 is not what is authentic now. Uh, anyway, um, Chris, uh, <clears throat> Chris Lutio says, AA, could you make a stream on how to get into watching wrestling for newcomers like me? Yeah, okay. All right. When I'm better, I'll, I'll do that. I'm, I'm going to see AA Lodge tomorrow. And I'm hoping in a dream world, I just say, yeah, I'm going to buy it now and move in. Like, not move in, but like get to like be there over the weekend. Um, so uh, I'm hoping my productivity will skyrocket once I have it. Hey, I still think you should buy a caravan and you know, <clears throat> have a move. Yeah, they're po they're yeah. poxy. They're poxy, though, D. Have you seen them? Hey. Oh, yeah, they're terrible, but you know, still. <laughs> Bel Belfast Knight says uh, that feeling when an example of right wing postmodern referencing mimetic artists is Stone Toss. <laughs> yeah, um, but you know Stone Toss. Stone Toss is a mimetic artist of some power. I would say. Um, Jedi Knight and the Queen Cringe Walker says the camera obscura was widely used too, so perhaps the photograph didn't end painting; it merely domesticated it. Uh. I'm a little bit skeptical. Uh, I, I don't know how I'd be interested to hear how Mr. Adams feels about this, but I'm a bit skeptical of these extraordinary claims made for the camera obscura. There's a, a documentary film was made by, I think, Teller from Penn and Teller of a, of a guy who tried to produce, to, to reproduce uh, a painting by Vermeer uh, using uh, camera obscura. Um, and I think David Hockney also was, was very big on this theory. I mean, yes, it, 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 and, and camera obscura was used to some extent in certainly an experimental uh, phase very long ago. 
as was you know all sorts of grid systems you know uh for, for kind of reproducing things reproducing drawings and actually even drawing you know physical objects but the extent to which this had an effect on art i think it is is overstated i don't know uh yeah i would largely agree with that i think that's a very fair assessment the the book and the film by documentary by David Hocken is called Secret Knowledge. And basically it says that the camera obscura, which for people who don't know, it's it's basically projecting, uh, it's a sort of, it is a box where you have a lens at one end and basically you get, um, you get a, a projected image um, uh, coming out at the other end and you can basically trace this and use this. Uh, like it's like a sort of basically a slide projector. Um, yeah. And it was sort of originated in the in the the Dutch Republic in the 17th century, and um, yeah, um, Vermeer is known to have used one. But he did actually take liberties; he did make changes, so he didn't follow completely what was there. Uh, yeah. Interestingly, if you're if you want to see the first um, sort of lens based um, photographic blur, you yeah, so it's, yeah, it comes out inverted on the other side. If you want to find the first uh, lens-based based blur, you can actually find it in a Vermeer painting. There's a woman playing a guitar, and there's actually a blur, motion blur, and that comes about sort of 300 years before the first photograph. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, it, and it works the same as a pinhole camera for people who, you know, uh, I mean, you basically if you put a small hole in, in a box like that, all the light going into it is going to be kind of, you know, squished down to a pinpoint in its case. Yeah, you, you can have you can have one with a pinhole or you can have one yeah. with a lens. Or yeah. with or with a lens, yeah. You're gonna yeah. get more much more uh fidelity and sharpness with, with proper lens. But uh, okay. it, it's I, the same it's the same <laughs> idea. I can see those people in the chat. I know what you're thinking. Cut it out. Okay. What? I'm talking what? to the people in the chat. Hole in the what? wall. That doesn't matter. Oh, okay. God's <laughs> sake. Let's wrap up. You're I don't know what they mean. A pinhole, mate. Jesus. But let's wrap this up. <laughs> let's wrap this up because uh, we're going long, and I'm getting the the wind up sign from Mrs. AA. Alexandra Adams, anything you'd like to promote, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, so first of all, um, thanks for asking me on, and I would direct people to Pharaoh's channel. We're doing a stream on Orientalism, I think, on Saturday at nine o'clock, I believe. But just uh, if you subscribe to Pharaoh's channel, you'll see that. If you want to support me or my work then you can buy two books, which are Culture War and Iconoclasm. They're available online now. The The cover image, someone asked, uh, Ivan Popovac asked what the cover image is. Cover image is um, statue of, question statue of George Washington in New York. I invented the attacker, you'll be happy to know, and I invented the graffiti, and that is on the cover of my book called Iconoclasm. Is that statue in, do you know if it's in Manhattan or Brooklyn? I, I think that's the Manhattan one. Okay, sure. okay. Yeah, I, I remember seeing them. Uh, yeah, I was trying to figure it out if that was Washington or not. So, do, do you any uh, anything you want to promote? <coughs> I just I just second having a look at Alexander Adams' website and uh, and books and also the wonderful streams that he does with Pharaoh and my friend Panama Hat uh, on oh, Ferris thank you very much. channel. Thank you. Yeah, very, very good stream. I'm looking forward to the Orientalist one because I, I quite like some of those artists. So. Great. And um, I will just promote tomorrow, 8 p.m. The trailer came out just before the show. <laughs> Women's Hour. Oh, God. Five women, unfiltered, no man on the stream. Um, you know, it's been hilarious, D. I put, like, see it because I've just let them, like, plan it. Literally, they're talking about men, clothes, food. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool. just like yeah, I was going to say, number one, they're going to talk about men because that's what they do, <laughs> and number two, they're going to talk about you know, cakes, clothing, shoes. <laughs> yeah. and, and and then in theory, I'm doing a cigar stream after that, but I'm feeling like I'm dying right now. But... Yeah, I thought you weren't going to. I thought you gave it over to Farrow and Mr. Adams. Are you? No, no, well, I, I just got too interested in the topic, just like you, D. You know, yeah, I, uh, I couldn't stay away. Yeah. We got drawn in. Uh, <coughs> anyway, I, I'm going to have to go. Make sure you buy a course at the academic agency. Buy a course. People asking about um, uh, foundations of politics. I'm going to have to wait until I get into AA Lodge to write that, I think, realistically. And then once once I'm there, it'll come out very quickly. Um, okay. 
uh, Miss uh, AAA is now calling I, me as well. I hear the warbling in the background. Bye, everyone. Get out. Thank you so much, Alexander Adams, for your time today. Thank Bye-bye. you.